Good evening and welcome back to the special city council meeting. We began on Monday, February 12th. It is now Tuesday, February 13th. We will we or we'll start off where we left off uh, with Attorney Eggleston. Um, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'd like to uh, call first uh, Rick Beckstead to the stand. <clears throat> And uh, Mr. Beckstead, you are still under oath. Yes. Mr. Beckstead, will you please state your name and spell your last name for the record? Yes, uh, Rick Beckstead. It's B E C K S T E D. Are you familiar with this council chamber room, Mr. Beckstead? Served four years here of my life in these chambers. And what was your, in what capacity did you serve in these chambers? My first term, I actually had the ninth seat where Councillor Lombardi is right now for two years, and then I served where Mayor McEachern sits as mayor for two years. And so you were the mayor for two years? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> when did your term end? Well, technically the, the term ends is when the new mayor actually takes its role during the inauguration. So. I think it's a little bit past the January 1st, uh, if I remember correctly. Of what year? And that would be of 22 uh, was when Mayor McEachern took, took the seat. Okay, so the election for that particular uh, inauguration occurred in November of 2021? Correct. Okay. Now, uh, between the election and the time when you stepped down and Mayor McEachern uh, stepped in, um, I understand you appointed several members to various different planning boards, including Mr. Hewitt to the planning board, right? Yes, I did. Okay. Can you explain why you chose Mr. Hewitt to uh, be on the planning board? Mr. Hewitt is one of those exemplary residents um, that basically shows up at meetings, partakes, does research, uh, very knowledgeable um, in life and in his career to be able to have an engineer. Um, to be able to be on with the planning board would be extremely valuable to the city of Portsmouth. Was there any issue uh, from your perspective in the fact that he worked for the Department of Transportation? My opinion, working for the New Hampshire DOT, I did not see that there would be any um, reserves on him taking that position. We had actually already had a New Hampshire DES member that was serving, uh, just actually expired uh, his term uh, in December of last year. So I didn't see any conflict of any kind that would happen with New Hampshire DOT. Did that particular member who uh, worked for DES uh, add value to the process through his experience, education, and knowledge? Very much so. I mean, I think that they went and he educated the board itself and sometimes with staff. Uh, he knew things and had knowledge that no one else would. And I think the city, the planning board, I believe even the planning department in the city of Portsmouth greatly appreciated having him, his services basically for free. It was a volunteer situation. Okay. Um, and at the time of the appointments that you made uh, in, for, for lack of a better word, the lame duck period of your office, um, did you get any resistance from any quarter about appointing board members uh, as your time in office was coming to a close? I literally right up until I had made the last of appointments with the vote of the council, I had gotten a lot of resistance. The, the one that was most troubling was, so the way that it works is the mayor meets with uh, staff, usually with the city manager, with Kelly Barnaby, and anyone else as far as to sit the agenda. So on November 10th, I sat down with staff up in the conference room on the fourth floor, and we basically put the agenda together for the 15th, and at that meeting, I was actually bringing forward for consideration, not just Jim Hewitt, but several other uh, members to be appointed to boards. Okay, and what was the reaction of staff at that time to those appointments? So at the end of that meeting, Karen Kennard, the city manager, actually went and said that Suzanne Woodland would like to have a word with me after we were done. I have no problem with that. I meet with staff all the time. And who is Suzanne years. Woodland? Suzanne Woodland at the time was the deputy attorney, and I think at that time she might have been kind of an active role of the deputy city manager. Okay. And what was it she had to tell you at that point? So it wasn't so much Suzanne speaking to me. The terms that were used were we. So she said we, 
are, you know, greatly um, appreciate everything that you've done for the city. We know how much you love the city of Portsmouth, and we know that you're going to be back. But as in consideration, no other member brought forward as far as with my appointments that I would like to be considered, the name Jim Hewitt came up. And what ended up happening was she went through a dialogue of concerns that we, meaning probably the city itself, would have concerns with, one of them being conflict of interest because of New Hampshire DOT. He would have to recuse himself multiple times. It just wasn't a good fit, and we believe that it probably wouldn't be the best appointment for you because when it comes to these appointments, it reflects on the mayor's position. I see. So you had active resistance from City Hall appointing Jim Hewitt to begin with. Before the, as the agenda had just been concluded and was moving forward, yes, on that day. Did any of the uh, current members of the city council uh, vote against Jim Hewitt for that particular office? For that office, it would be Councilor Tabor that actually spoke against it. Uh, there were two others um, that actually spoke and voted against it as well that are not here. So Council Lazenby was one of them, and then the other one was, uh, was Assistant Mayor Splain. Um, based on that testimony, I think we need to ask Councilor Tabor to recuse himself from this matter because he opposed Jim Hewitt from the very start and voted against him. Uh, I'll defer to Attorney Lachlan. Um, um, I guess the test is whether um, there is a um, anything to indicate that because he, the, the council voted against um, Mr. Hewitt's nomination, any reason to believe that he um, is not, cannot be uh, disinterested in the vote on this particular matter? I don't see it. Well, I think he needs to make that determination under the law, Mr. Laughlin. But I, we are objecting on that. I, I would like to add to that as well, though, because what ended up happening on that night, it is on video. I'm actually very familiar because I watched the video today. They t actually, we separated what the appointments were going to be th that was controversial. What ended up happening was, was the land use appointments were voted on separately than the rest of the appointments that night. It was actually something I think, Mayor McEachern, uh, you had kind of uh, alluded to about separating them. And between that, um, I know that Councilor Tabor, Council Lazenby, and uh, Assistant Mayor voted against the appointment. So it was a discussion that actually took place to separate them. If I could just be heard for a minute on, on the issue, generally speaking. Uh, actually, it is a, a decision for Councilor Tabor to make, um, but the legal guidance is whether he's conflicted in this matter and whether the simple fact that he was not in favor of the initial appointment has anything to do with the issues before the council tonight. Um, I don't see that the, the two bear any resemblance or are or, or comparable, but that is again up to Councillor Tabor, Tabor to um, make his own decision if he has some, you know, feelings, particularly about Mr. Hewitt that have been there since he voted against him, or if he can set aside any prior feelings and actually um, reach a fair and impartial decision in this case. And I concur that that's the test. Uh, we're placing the objection in the record because the New Hampshire Supreme Court has said that if we have such an objection, we need to make it at the earliest possible time. The decision under the law about recusal for any board member of any kind is that it's up to the board member at the end of the day. So that is my request. Uh, Your Honor. <clears throat> I had I hadn't remembered that vote, but the mayor, former mayor is, is correct. Um, I don't agree with uh, Jim Hewitt on on things, but I think our job here is to weigh the evidence, make a finding of fact on the specific information uh, that is been put before us. Uh, so I think the question would be, can I be an impartial juror? Um, and uh, <clears throat> I think that I can objectively and impartially weigh the facts that we're hearing tonight. Thank you. 
Mr. Beckstead, um, why do you think Mr. Hewitt's appointment was so controversial? I, th I think because I, I speak my own opinion. I, mean, I was very outspoken before I was elected uh, my first term on the council. I served four years as a private resident that attended, and most people will agree with me, almost at every land use board meeting for four years. I have a very understanding wife. Uh, children go to bed at night, which is when most of the meetings happen. So um, I was an advocate. Um, I helped neighborhoods when they had concerns about overdevelopment, knocking down houses, concerns. Jim Hewitt is that very same thing. He stands up for people. It's one of the reasons why I got involved, and I thought it was just a, a great thing for Mr. Hewitt to be able to go and step up and, and partake in a role um, that he would fit, be fit for. And so, uh, but why would that be controversial with the city of Portsmouth? Probably because you wouldn't play by the rules. Um, for the better part of my two years as mayor, I lived what Mr. Hewitt is living right now. Pushback, concerns were raised. Why this? Why that? It just, I guess we didn't go with the flow of things. We interrupted things. <laughs> I'll tell you what, it would have been a lot more uh, effective for the residents of Portsmouth if we weren't dealing with COVID. Um, but you had to tiptoe on what you were willing to go and uh, speak up against, uh, speak for. Um, there was a lot of reluctancy, and I got a feeling that that was probably what people were expecting was they were going to have that type of pushback uh, from Mr. Hewitt, and that's why they were so uh, objective to his appointment. And uh, are you familiar uh, of, with the things of which Mr. Hewitt has been accused in this matter? Right to know. What, what just generally, having looked at the charge sheet, yep. what do you make of it all? Looking at the evidence, malfeasance, looking at the evidence of right to know, I, I'm just having a hard time having it fit the, you know, a, a crime that's been committed. Um, I know what malfeasance is if you misinform somebody um, and they go and come to a conclusion or a vote, um, that's malfeasance. Like you had said last night as far as stealing, taking, profiting, that's a malfeasance. Right to know, uh, we got hundreds and hundreds of emails from staff as a council as a whole. And we had a few times, there was one counselor in particular um, that a few times would go and reply off. And you would start a dialogue and a conversation what took place. And Bob Sullivan would go and say that it would take, if it was that fourth reply, you now have five in a minimum, and that's a conflict. And that's part of the right to know. Right. But did any of those counselors get removed for that conduct? No. Um, I'm sure if we weren't counselors and we were board members, you might be, uh, be here as well uh, as Mr. Hewitt is. So in your opinion, Mr. Beckstead, what should happen in this case? <laughs> I wish it never happened. I apologize to Mr. Hewitt, both Jim and his wife, for having to live through something that I and many other people have gone and lived through. I, it, it's, it's unfair. Um, I think Mr. Hewitt should be able to serve out his term. Um, there was no law that was broken. I mean. Everything that I saw last night, witnesses and testimony, and it's a rule, but it's not in black and white. It's a rule, but it's not in print. So it's to be basically uh, kind of complied with when you don't know the rules. That was why a tiptoe. Every time Jim made a, a step, they went and he got a pushback and was told, oh, you can't do this. Oh, you can't do that. So in my mind, I would go and say, you can't do this, Jim, or you can't do that. <clears throat> and let him finish out his term. Um, he, he is great value to the city of Portsmouth, and uh, we, we desperately need him. Thank you very much, Mr. Beckstead. Attorney Morrill may have questions. You want the mic? Sure. Thank you, Attorney Eggleston. Are you passing the mic over? Yeah. Okay. We should make a note to get two microphones in the future. <laughs> I think that's on his Christmas list now. <laughs> it's in the budget. All right. Let's hope we don't need it again. <laughs> Fair enough. So, Mr. Bickstead, um, from what I understand, Attorney Woodland, who was the deputy city attorney at the time, 
and um, typically participated in the what agenda review where you brought up your appointments right is that what you're saying in so November? she actually she did not partake in in the meeting itself she came into the room after we had finished up okay. setting the agenda all right mm -hmm. and so you had a conversation with attorney Woodland about the appointments that you were um, proposing uh, not appointments the one appointment the concern okay. of mr. Hewitt so there are other appointments there was a number of other appointments there was um, quite a few in fact correct and there was one objection correct okay and the one objection um, you said had more to do with mr. Hewitt's um, profession with the Department of Transportation that would be a conflict of interest sometimes I'm here to have to recuse himself from multiple projects when it came to dealing with New Hampshire DOT right okay and um, now you also said that at times there were problems with um, email correspondence going between a quorum of the City Council no I just went and gave that as an example as far as an email going out which is what mr. Hewitt's emails Yep. goes out to the planning board and to the chair and to the planning department I believe was listed on there yep. an email went one way no emails of any kind were going in the back I think you said when you were on the City Council that there were some issues with that with Bob Sullivan and he had some discussion with the council members because somebody would go and reply all and he would just give a fair warning before we would get to that type of a violation right but he cautioned you all correct that this is could be a problem if somebody hits reply all and you end up in a quorum having a discussion correct and that would be a violation of the right to know law correct but the okay. objections that are being made with <coughs> mr. Hewitt's emails yeah, that's is the question. content yeah but my question is about what you said earlier and um, and you were asked if um, any one of the city councilors was if there was a removal hearing and you said no but if we were planning board members that might have been different is that what you said no that's not what I said okay so you understand that there's a difference in a role between a city councilor who is a legislator um, and a planning board member who's sitting in front of applicants in this quasi judicial role you yes I do that? okay in that there are, are different limitations on a planning boards uh, members conduct than there are on a city councilors conduct because of that from from what I saw of mr. Hewitt's emails no I'm not asking about the emails I'm just asking if you understand that there's a difference between the role as a legislator and the role as a planning board <coughs> member sitting <coughs> on applications no I know the difference with that I've also served on I've also served on the recreation board and we got the same type of emails which would be subject to the exact same thing mr. Hewitt's being yeah. accused of but you weren't sitting as a land use board member no I was not um, nothing further nothing further thank you mr. Beckstead thank you any questions of the council oh sorry go ahead uh, Councilor Bagley Thank you, Honor, and uh, thank you for attending tonight, Mr. Beckstead. Um, you you had one quote. Um, the city, I think, was nervous maybe because he wouldn't play by the rules. Could you just expound on that? I think maybe you, what you meant by that. Play by the rules? You said uh, you you were concerned because, or you said that you thought the city was concerned because he wouldn't play by the rules. Mr. Hewitt has his own opinions when it comes to certain things and he would not I guess play by the rules of what is expected and has been expected for many years at least the better part of 12 years on what the role of a any land use board member is um, there would be some reluctancies there would be questions that were asked that weren't asked um, by previous land use board members um, and that's what I meant by playing by the rules okay thank you I didn't want to put the words in your mouth but you're using it as like a figure of speech not yep he wouldn't play by the rules in a technical sense yep okay thank you yep. <laughs> any further questions thank you thank you mr. Beck said you're excused thank you mr. Bagley that was a good clarification Jim <clears throat>
Mr. Hewitt, would you please state your name and spell your last name for the record for me? It's uh, James Asa Hewitt, H-E-W-I-T-T. Tell me a little bit, first of all, where do you live in Portsmouth? I live at uh, 726 Middle Road. And uh, what do you do for work? I'm an engineer for the New Hampshire Department of Transportation. And are you professionally educated as such? Yes, I have uh, uh, undergraduate degree in civil engineering and a graduate degree in civil engineering, and I'm a licensed engineer. How long have you been a practicing uh, professional engineer in the city, in the state of New Hampshire? Oh, 38 years. Okay. And uh, at present, whom do you work for? The New Hampshire Department of Transportation. How long have you been with them? Ten years. <clears throat> Prior to that, uh, what did you do? I worked in private consulting engineering, and I also worked for the New Hampshire De uh, Department of Environmental Services. Okay, so you have environmental engineering experience? Yes. And then what did you do as a private consulting engineer? What was your focus? Well, I, my first job out of college was uh, uh, construction engineering for large power plant companies, different power plants around uh, the Northeast, and uh, which brought me to New Hampshire. And then I worked for a small site survey engineering firm doing development projects. And then uh, those, and then after Department of Environmental Services, I worked for uh, water and wastewater company. And were you on the uh, water provision side or the wastewater side? In the uh, <clears throat> at Wright Pierce, I worked I worked on uh, clean water, drinking water. Okay. And in all of these positions, um, did you uh, regularly interact with? Uh, city and town ordinances, regulations, zoning ordinances, subdivision regulations, things of that nature, setbacks? Yes, very much so. That's okay. kind of the job. Okay. So you would, on a regular basis throughout your career, apply different levels of regulation to various projects that you were seeking approval for? Correct. Okay. And you still do that today with the DOT? Correct. I see a lot of site plans, development projects, et cetera. Do you feel like that experience was germane to your work on the planning board? Very much so, because I see um, the same set of plans that come to the planning board often come to the Department of Transportation for access to the state's highway system. Uh, before you became a board member in the city of Portsmouth, had you ever occupied another volunteer position or office in Portsmouth? Not in Portsmouth. How about other places you lived? Yes, when I uh, when we lived in Durham, um, I was appointed to the Lamprey River Lamprey River Advisory Committee. Okay, and uh, you said you've lived in Portsmouth for ten years. Um, how long were you in Durham before that? Twenty. And then before that, did you live in Portsmouth? Correct. For how long? Uh, from nineteen eighty six to nineteen ninety three. Okay. Uh, in your time since you and your wife moved back. To to Portsmouth, would you say that you've taken an interest in uh, community affairs, let's call it? It wasn't our plan to, honestly, when uh, we left Durham. We, we kind of talked about trying to stay anonymous, but uh, it was hard for me to do that. So um, I got drawn into Portsmouth um, activities first with Mark Brighton and the Portsmouth Taxpayers Association, and that led me to other folks regarding the Pierce Island Wastewater Treatment Plant. Okay, and what was your concern or your group's concern with the wastewater treatment plant? Uh, it's a very complicated project, very expensive, $100 million, and um, the Pierce Island property is very small. It was a very small envelope to build a plant there. And uh, the city eventually chose uh, a treatment process called BAF, which is biological aer aerated fil filtration. And uh, kind of controversial, not really used that much in the Northeast. And uh, there were some of my um, like-minded uh, friends 
thought that there were other options, including going to peas, trying to expand the peas wastewater plant, and also potentially going outside the fence line okay. with a different process. And so you and your group opposed this particular iteration of the plan. Did you succeed in your opposition? No, we did not. Okay. So um, are you, generally speaking, opposed to development in Portsmouth? Not at all. Um, in your time on the planning board, um, what percentage of time did you approve applications that came before the board? Well, as part of this process I'm going through right now, I, I thought it would be a good idea to actually determine how many, what my voting record was. So I went through every meeting minutes for the last two years, and I counted up my votes. <clears throat> And uh, it's approximate, of course, but I counted 310 yeses and 17 noes, which computes to a 95% yes. So I'm showing you Exhibit K right in front of you uh, mm -hmm. for the record. Is that the summary of your voting record that you compiled based on the meeting minutes that are available publicly? Yes, it is. It's on the basis of that summary that you did your calculation? Correct. So going back uh, to mm. the time before you became a board member and you were just a private citizen, uh, were you active in the 2021 city council election? Yes, I was. In what way? Um, there was a group called the Portsmouth Citizen Alliance, which had started two years earlier with Stephen Erickson, that was uh, heavily involved in getting Rick Beckstead, Paige Trace, Esther Kennedy, Peter Huda, and Peter Whalen elected. And um, the, two years later, uh, Stephen Erickson had moved away or was no longer active. So it kind of fell on my shoulders to take up whatever what was left of that group and to help those candidates. And so um, it was very <clears throat> a very small operation. There was no funding. And I think all. Uh, Horseman Citizens Alliance did was send out a, a survey to all the candidates. But you were publicly uh, on the record in favor of those candidates, correct? Very much so. And what yes. candidates were you opposing in that election? All nine that are sitting here today. Okay, so the very candidates you opposed in that election are the ones judging you now, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. <coughs> After the election, uh, when did you learn that Mr. Beckstead had uh, suggested that you become a planning board member? I believe uh, sometime after the election, late November, he called me. Um, I did not seek the planning board position. I, uh, I know how much work it is, but when the mayor called, I figured I had to step up. And uh, what was your reaction when you were asked? Well, of course, I was honored when the mayor of my city called me and thought I'd be a good member. Okay. And when were you sworn in as a member? Uh, there's not really a, a swearing in ceremony for planning board. You just kind of show up. So my first meeting was January 27th, uh, 2022. Okay. So um, you've heard reference uh, in the earlier testimony with Mr. Sullivan um, to the city's Exhibit 1, which I'm going to put in front of you here. Uh, and I think we've covered this ground pretty effectively <clears throat> for the most part, but I do want to make sure we're absolutely clear on the timeline here. So Saturday, December 11th, you sent an email to a group of people and you copy Mr. Britz and the planning department on it. And at that point, had you been nominated for uh, the planning board? Yes. Had you been approved by the city council yet? Yes. Okay, so you were a future planning board member, right? Correct, yes. <clears throat> and were you actually sitting on any issue at this time? No. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, this uh, vote, in fact, occurred on what date? The vote to put me on the board? No, no, I'm sorry, the vote in the Rains Avenue project. Oh, 
That's the subject of Exhibit yeah, 1. Uh, that was December 16th of 21. Okay. And um, remind me again the date that the City Council approved you? December 6th of 21. Okay. And so, but you didn't sit on the Planning Board meeting on December 16th, 2021, correct? No, that's correct. All right. So it was approved. That project was fully approved before you ever took up your position as a Planning Board member, right? Correct. So when you sent that email, you were acting as a private citizen. Is that fair to say? That's very fair, yes. Okay. Now, uh, turning to uh, Exhibit 2. which is the second alleged instance of malfeasance. Exhibit 2, we talked a little bit about yesterday with Attorney Sullivan and Mr. Chelman. And in this sequence of emails, we learned that you emailed the planning department director and asked her to include, oh, excuse me, you emailed Mr. Britz in the planning department and asked him to include New Hampshire DES site evaluations for four pieces of land, correct? Actually four sites, four contaminated, allegedly contaminated sites. Okay. How did you know about those sites? I know about them in two ways. Being a longtime Portsmouth resident, I knew that area of town had issues, and secondly, when I worked for the Department of Environmental Services, I worked in the Waste Management Division uh, that worked on cleaning up these sites. So I, I was very aware of all the hometown sites in Portsmouth. Okay. And what, what were the issues that you understood to be affecting this piece of land, these pieces of land? Well, the, the one that I – the two that – well, there's, there was Cindy Ann Cleaners, which is a dry cleaner, which notoriously have problems. I think there was an asbestos site. There was Mako Auto Body back there, and, and I forgot the third. Maybe a petroleum site. Okay. I mean the fourth. Why did you think that that was important information for the board to have before it as it considered the application? Because the information that had been provided to to me when I was a planning board member or didn't have any any record of the status of those properties? Have they been evaluated? Have they been cleaned up? Will those will that site be safe for people to live and work on? And you felt that was an important thing for the planning board to take into consideration? Yes. Okay. Did you, in this uh, email sequence, indicate that you were not going to vote for the project? No. Uh, in fact, what was your state of mind about how to vote on this project? I had the rehearing. I had no kind of preconceived notions. I, okay. So is it fair to say that this was simply <laughs> an information request? Right, that I thought was important for me and the other planning board members to be aware of. Okay. And um, if you look at the fifth page in, there's an email from you dated Friday, February 18th, 2022, to Mr. Sullivan and Mr. Britz, copying Mr. Chelman. You see it, it begins understood. Yes, yes I do. You said, recently it takes a few whacks to get new information to register in my post-COVID-19 adult brain. Is it possible to obtain answers to my questions for community knowledge that complies with jury standard requirements? And as we discussed with Mr. Sullivan yesterday, um, his response to that was, I'm sorry, hold on. I'm just trying to find it. He said, on Tuesday, February 22nd, in response to your question, you've asked a complex question and I do not immediately know the answer, i.e., how to deal with community knowledge that's out there that you want in the record, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Did you ever uh, get a response from him on that particular question? No, I did not.
And when you sent an email out to Mr. Chelman and other board members, did anyone ever respond to that email, reply to that email? No. Okay. So you put an email out into the ether. There was no further discussion about that email electronically, correct? Correct. Um, and this was all in anticipation of a February 17th, 2022 planning board meeting at which the Rains Avenue uh, issue would be reheard. Um, did that vote occur? No, it did not. Did the hearing occur? No. What happened? As I recall, uh, the day of the meeting in the morning at some point, uh, the city was notified a judge had ruled that the planning board had no jurisdiction to hear this and it was removed from the agenda. Do you have any other knowledge about that legal process? No. Okay. So as far as you're concerned, the, the case just went away, is that right? Correct. Okay, so you never had a chance to vote on the issue? No. Um, and not taking a vote, nobody asked you to recuse yourself? No. The board never voted to recuse you? No. Okay. Um, no applicant ever appealed a decision that you voted on in the in relation to that case? Correct. No, no one did that. Okay. Turning now to Exhibit 3. Exhibit 3 pertains to an email that you sent to Beverly Zent, who was then the planning director for the city of Portsmouth. And obviously we heard testimony about it yesterday. I'd like you to flip, if you could, to page two of two in the bottom right, which would be the third sheet of paper in the document. Right, yep. <clears throat> um, as both Mr. Chelman and Mr. Sullivan read, what you said to Ms. Uh, Zent was, could you please add an addendum to the March 17, 2022 planning board packet with the following West End Yards information? And uh, so this request was to the planning director, correct? correct yes. And um, what was it that you were seeking to have added to the packet? Well, since uh, the planning board was going to be um, reviewing a request for additional parking at West End Yards, I thought it was important for the planning board to have background information on when it was originally approved in 2019. So I sent the action sheet from March 21, 19, and... Um, of a, a, a YouTube video of attack review when they discussed why they needed more parking. So, and then the other YouTube video? Uh, that must have been uh, the actual March meeting, perhaps? I, okay. So they were both recorded archives of public meetings held by the city of Portsmouth. Is that right? That's correct. And the two documents, the PDF documents that you asked to send, were public documents that were part of the file for this piece of land and this developer who were now on your agenda, right? Correct. Okay. Why was it that you thought that the board at its meeting would benefit from having this information in the information packet? I thought it provided good background on how um, we got to this position, um, what planning standard, what parking standards were used, and why they fell so woefully short of the actual demand. Because well, what, incidentally, what was this applicant, West End Yards? What were they asking for that night? 120 or 95 uh, more parking spaces. Okay, so. Um, when you talk about adding it to the packet, what is the packet? Uh, the planning board packet is similar to the city council packet. It's um, 
a collection of all the information that was submitted to the planning department as part of the applications. And it's what's available for the board to consider as they prepare for the hearing? Correct. Is it public information? Yes. Okay, so you wanted this public information to be included in the public information that would be presented to the planning board for consideration, correct? Correct, yes. Okay. So your goal wasn't to have this surreptitiously considered by the board, right? No, not at all. You wanted to make sure it was something that was available and discussed or at least considered at the meeting, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, at the point that you sent that email suggesting that it was useful information, had you decided how you were going to vote on the project? No. Um, is there any language in this email which suggests you decided how to vote on the project? No. It's just an information request. Um, and when you voted on the project, uh, actually when you attended the meeting, was there discussion about the parking issue? Yes. And what was the decision ultimately uh, with respect to um, that particular application? Uh, the planning board, I believe, voted unanimously to approve it. Okay. Were there any conditions placed on that vote? Yes, I, uh, I requested a condition be placed on the vote to have a parking demand study performed on this site because I felt it was a perfect opportunity to have real Portsmouth-related parking demand information on a relatively large project that have different size uh, living units. So I felt uh, this is our time to ask for it as a condition of approval that they do a, a parking demand study. And did, uh, uh, did Mr. Chelman agree with you on that? Yes. Yeah, he signed on to that, right? Correct. And in fact, the, the, the board voted to approve that condition as a condition of approval, right? Right. And did the applicant submit that parking study? Yes, uh, it was submitted to the planning department in May, and the planning board got it in September or October. Okay. And um, in that case, did the applicant ask you to recuse yourself? No. Did any board member ask you to recuse yourself on the basis of this email? No. Did, uh, did the board vote to have you recused? No. Was there any appeal of that decision by the applicant? No. Was the decision ever reversed by a court due to your failure to follow the jury standard, if there was any? No. Okay. Um, uh, and incidentally, uh, going back to uh, Exhibit 2, which we discussed a few minutes ago, where you had asked for environmental studies, there were two components to that that the city identified as being problematic. The first was the initial request to Mr. Britz. Do you recall that you subsequently sent an email to the Conservation Commission asking them to consider those issues going forward? Correct, I did. Um, I had requested, I, I, it was a kind of a short time frame between when the Playmore gets the packet on a Friday and we have to meet on a Thursday. So I think I believe over the weekend I sent the email to Mr. Britz and I asked for this information I believe by Wednesday noon or something to that effect. And uh, when it didn't arrive, I, he never responded, I thought to myself, well, this is not going to be available for the vote. So I, I, I sent it to the Conservation Commission as a heads up, like, you know, if we're not going to deal with this, maybe you should be aware of it in the future. Um, and if you flip, do you still have Exhibit 2 there in front of you? If you flip to the third to last page. which is Wednesday, February 16th, 2022, at 4.47 p.m., you emailed the Conservation Commission, right? Mm -hmm. On the third from the end of the 
Yes, if you go to the very last page in the document. Oh, dear Conservation Commission. On Feb Feb February 16th, yep. 2022. Yes, I see. See that one? Mm-hmm. You say FYI on the below and attached, right? Correct. So for your information, are you telling the Conservation Commission how to vote on anything? No. You say, in fact, in the future, right? Mm -hmm. If City Hall, it, City, City Hall allows projects to be approved on contaminated property with no idea about the potential adverse effects on human health and the environment, I hope the Conservation Commission will assume that role so Portsmouth fulfills its obligation as an eco-municipality. City Hall has been equally dismissive on the need for any NHDS permits prior to or as condition of approval, correct? Correct. Are you talking about any specific project there? No. You're making a suggestion, aren't you? Yes. Are they welcome to take that suggestion up or not? Certainly, yes. I'm going to show you now another exhibit, which is our exhibit P, P as in pony. Sorry, was that P as in pony? Potato. Potato. Okay, yes. not E. Patata. So uh, looking at exhibit P here, it looks like if you flip to the back page, um, maybe the second page, at the bottom, you write an email on March 20th, 2022 to Beverly Zent, and you copy Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Chelman, city manager, and Nicholas Cracknell. Do I see that? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, and you uh, send an email to Ms. Uh, Zent attaching a couple of uh, parking studies. That's, that's correct. What was the purpose of that email? Well, um, the planning board meeting about West End Yards was on the 16th, a, thir a Thursday, and on Sunday, I thought uh, perhaps the planning department could uh, be receptive to receiving some information about parking in general, just, you know, why, uh, how parking is, is determined in other parts of Portsmouth and other parts of the country. So I sent uh, Beverly uh, an email that had information about parking at uh, Southgate Plaza, the Viridian 95 unit project, where they used, I believe, two parking spaces per unit. And then I did a quick search on the internet for some other generic site that I found in Albany, New York, that also uh, was similar to the two, two spaces per unit. So I thought that they could uh, find that useful. Okay. And this wasn't in relation to any particular uh, project that was in front of the board, right? No, this is just a general FYI. Okay. Is it fair to say that as a matter of policy, uh, you believe that the, the board was approving or historically had approved projects that uh, lacked sufficient parking? That's correct, and uh, Weston Yards was the most glaring example of that. Okay, because they were approved for a certain amount of parking, and then a couple of years later, they were back again asking for more, right? That's right. So you identified that as a defect, in essence, in Portsmouth's policy around correct. these issues. Correct, yes. And that's why you wanted to bring this stuff to their attention. Mm, that's right. Was any of this, uh, obviously, it happened after the vote on the West End Yards project. Right. Which you approved, right? Yes. Uh, was this in any way... Uh, an effort to favor or oppose the West End Yards project or any other project? No, it was just an attempt to help uh, improve our parking regulations. Showing you our exhibit Q.
that's part of the discussion between Ms. Zent and you about the planning board video and those two PDFs from the West End Yards approval back in 2019. Mr. Sullivan sent you a reprimand, your third reprimand in as many months. And that was on March 16th, 2022. If you turn to the second to last page in this document, Exhibit Q. Yes. Is that the email that Mr. Sullivan sent you in relation to your email to Ms. Zent? That's correct. Okay. And um, so after that email, you sent him an email responding to that in September, I guess, September 21st, 2021, 22. Do you yes, see that? Yes, I do. What was it that you were asking him about in this email? Well, at some point between March and, and September, I became aware that uh, the zoning board in Portsmouth does, is not given recommendations on how to vote for a project, unlike the planning board. So I found that curious that and when I started to put all these things together, that the Portsmouth planning department is laser focused on eliminating bias on the planning department, but they're not so, I mean, on the, on the ZBA, but they are permitted to introduce bias, I felt, to the planning board. So I wanted Mr. Sullivan to explain that, that uh, discrepancy. And when you asked that question, um, what was his response? Do you remember? Uh, yes, he responds that uh, my question is more involved, my answer is more involved in, in my, your, my question, I'm sorry, is more involved and my answer would be more nuanced than could be handled by email. And he suggested a face-to-face -face discussion and meetings with Ms. Zent and others, correct? Yes. Did any of those meetings ever happen? No. Did you ever get an answer to your question? No. Okay. And uh, incidentally, uh, yesterday when uh, Mr. Sullivan and Mr. Chelman were talking about that exhibit number two, the, excuse me, exhibit number three where you had sent those PDFs and the video clips of the prior uh, meeting, um, that you should have sent it to the planning department first, right? But Correct. that's what you did, right? Yes. And in fact, um, what did Ms. Zent tell you when you sent it to her? She said, this is all public information, so we can just send it along. Okay. So you followed the rules, right? I interpreted we to mean us, so since I initiated that request, I sent it along. Okay. You did, in fact, exactly what Attorney Sullivan said you should have done, right? Correct. Um, now, uh, going back to this question of bias in the uh, first, in between the planning department and the zoning, uh, excuse me, the planning board and the zoning board, um, can you explain for the city council's appreciation what the planning department memorandum is and what role it plays in the planning department's planning board's meetings? Part of the planning board's monthly packet includes the agenda, the minutes, and also a staff memorandum which outlines uh, the technical and the legal aspects are, are just the, the issues, whether it's a site plan, subdivision, conditional use of permit, and uh, it also includes on every project their recommended motion. It usually includes two motions, motion to approve as is or a motion to approve with whatever amendments we may have. So the planning department tells you um, how to vote and then how you should vote on it, right? Well, it, it's, uh, it's their staff recommendation. So they're kind of saying, we've looked at it, therefore you should approve it. Right. So they're telling you what the planning department thinks you should do with this. Correct. Correct? Mm -hmm. Do you feel as a board member that that puts pressure on the board to comply with that instruction? Yeah, very much so. 
In what way? Well, it's, you know, we're volunteer planning board members and they're professional staffs. And so if we're reviewing something in, the, in a staff memo tell or instructs us or strongly encourage us to approve, it's, it's hard to go against that recommendation. So you kind of feel that you have to go along. And is that the bias that you referred to when you raised this issue with Attorney Sullivan? Yes, it is. And you still don't have an answer to that question, right? Right. Okay. Turning now to Exhibit 4, which is the 710 Middle Road mm. property. You said uh, a few minutes ago that you live at 726 Middle Road, correct? Yes. 710 Middle Road. Where is that house in relation to your house? It immediately abuts our property to the east. How far is uh, the neighbor's land from your house? The property line, his property line to our house is maybe six or eight feet. In fact, your driveway, you and he share a driveway, correct? Correct. Okay. We, I have an easement. The driveway's on uh, my neighbor's property. Okay. So uh, what did the uh, neighbor propose in this case? Uh, our neighbor proposed a very, uh, well, he proposed a detached auxiliary dwelling unit uh, in, in the rear of his property. And what was your and your wife's position on this particular request? We were not pleased at all. We were never given advance <coughs> notice of this happening, and uh, we were surprised to see it on the agenda. We had a week to prepare, so we were very much against it. Okay. And did you oppose it publicly? Yes. Did you sit in this room and speak against it? Yes, we did. And that was uh, when? That was in June of 2021. Were you a planning board member yet? No. Okay. So you were a private citizen opposing an abutters project that affected your interests, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, was that project approved by the planning board? Yes, it was. Were there any conditions on the approval? Yes, there were. Um, I'm showing you Exhibit S. Which was discussed yesterday. Uh, is that the city conditional use permit that the planning board issued in relation to 710's request? Yes, it is. Okay, and then you appealed that decision, right? We did. Actually litigated it into Superior Court. Correct. Did you prevail? No. So the project went ahead, right? Well, the approval stayed. The, the approval was upheld. Okay. And so uh, at some point, you reached out to Vincent Hayes asking about compliance with those conditions, right? Right. Uh, soon after the court ruled in my abutter's favor, I wanted to learn more about um, these conditions and how someone could learn their status. Okay. And so you emailed Mr. Hayes. Right. And you copied Mr. Chelman, right? Yes. So you weren't trying to be to hide the ball in any way, right? Not at all. Okay. And uh, you asked him about compliance with those conditions, right? Correct. So in your email of July 14th, 2022, which is on pay the third, fourth piece of paper in this document, are the issues that you raise in this email directly tied to each of the conditions in that conditional use permit? Yes, they are. Okay. So when uh, Attorney Sullivan or Mr. Chelman didn't understand what the heated first floor laundry room question was that you were raised, that's right in Exhibit S, isn't it? Yes, it is. Okay, so that was one of the conditions of the approval. Correct. So you were trying to find out whether the applicant had complied, right? Yes, exactly. It was just a cure. My, as an abutter, I just wanted to know where these conditions stood. Did you have any communications with Mr. Hayes or anyone else in the planning department uh, other than what's in this email packet? No. No telephone calls? No. No in-person conversations? No. And then uh, the viewpoint. Is that available to any citizen in Portsmouth who wants to find out 
about zoning approvals and planning approvals and so forth? Yes, to my knowledge. Okay. Did you understand uh, how to create a, an account for that? No. It, viewpoint is not very user-friendly, at least it wasn't at the time. It, I found it very unwieldy. But ultimately you did, right? Yes. I was able to get in there eventually after a few missteps. I, I ended up on the CIP page and started typing some information that I realized uh, after that I closed out of it. Next thing I know, it shows up on the CIP. I was like, well, how that happened? So. Oh, are you referring to the first document in Exhibit 4, this citizen request form? Right, yes. I that, see. It was clearly just, a, uh, again, I just was so unfamiliar with viewpoint, I ended up in the wrong place. Gotcha. So uh, Councillor Kelly uh, had a question for Mr. Chelman uh, yesterday, I think, about uh, the extension that you mentioned in this sequence of emails uh, and whether the applicant would need to extend approval of the project at some point. Right. Did that question, that request for an extension, come before the planning board? Yes, it did. When? Yeah, I think in April of 23. Okay. What did you do for that vote? I recused. Okay. You recused because you had a personal interest in the matter, right? Correct. I think... Uh, I think it's pretty clear based on uh, following a lawsuit that I was biased against it. Right. Um, so in this communication, did you uh, tell Mr. Hayes that you were a planning board member and you were ordering him to do this or that? No. Okay. Did you uh, tell him that you had any authority to make changes to the conditional use permit or demand different things? No. In fact, you had none of that authority, right? No, I, not, I don't. Okay. So in this capacity, you were acting as a private citizen, merely trying to ensure that the compliance with the conditions was overseen by the city, correct? That's it. Um, for the record, exhibits B... <clears throat> D, F, H, and J are all uh, meeting memoranda that are prepared by the planning, planning department for the planning board's consideration. And as my client testified, they contain <coughs> uh, motions and recommended results for your consideration. Now I'm showing you uh, Exhibit 5 from the city's packet, mm -mm. which is the sequence of communications surrounding the 375 Banfield Road property in October of 2023. What was located on that property for 50 or more years? I understood there it was called uh, Country Motors at the at most recently, and I guess throughout time, uh, there was a junkyard, salvage yard, uh, auto parts, and included a car crusher. And uh, how did you know about the existence of that business on that property? Um, well, I, I knew Country Motors was around a long time from living here for so long, and uh, through the material in the planning board packet. Okay, so from the material in the planning board packet, what did you come to understand about the environmental legacy of that business on that piece of land? Yeah, I believe that was that packet set the record for the planning board at 2,500 pages, and a large majority of that was uh, site, site characterizations of the contamination. And uh, what concerned you about actually? Stepping back a second, what was in front of the board that night? Uh, it was two, two requests. One was a site plan approval and one, the second was a subdivision request. Okay. And what were your concerns in relation to the environmental contamination that was uh, displayed openly by the applicant itself? 
my greatest concern had to do with the subdivision and how that would or would not potentially affect um, how that site would be cleaned up because it, it was still had some issues, outstanding issues, and I was I was concerned that by subdividing off the contaminated piece and leaving the valuable piece that it gives incentive for uh, a potential owner to abandon that site and uh, leave it for the taxpayers to clean up. Okay. And in fact, uh, wasn't there uh, in existence at time a lawsuit underway that concerned that very question? Who would be responsible for the cleanup of the site? Correct, there was. How did you come to learn about the lawsuit? I first read about it in the newspaper in late uh, 2022, at the end of the year, and there were several articles uh, describing the lawsuit out there. So that was before this particular project ever came onto your radar screen as a planning board member? That's right. Okay. And um, did you bring it to the attention of, meaning the lawsuit, to the attention of the planning board at the meeting? No. I mean, I'm sorry, it was already known, it, the planning department, I mean, it was, it was discussed at the meeting. Okay, so, so it was a subject of discussion. Right. In public. Yes. Okay, if you turn to page five of Exhibit I in front of you, which is the meeting minutes, I think they're the one at the top next to the microphone there. Oh, okay. This is the uh, meeting minutes for October 19th, 2023. Page five. Yes. There's a paragraph that begins, Mr. Hewitt asked. Correct. You see that? Yes. So this whole paragraph, is it fair to say, deals with the lawsuit, the impact of the lawsuit on the property, the effect of the lawsuit on the subdivision, and so forth? Right. Yeah. And would you say that your reaction at the meeting was energetic? It was. I. It was... Uh energetic to the point where right out pretty much at the very beginning I uh, which typically a routine yes vote is the package complete I voted no and why did you think the package was not complete I didn't feel the planning board or myself had enough information about the status of the legal issues and who was going to be responsible for cleaning it up because in your mind did that go to the question of subdivision which was before the board correct okay um, and uh, at what point in the meeting did you learn from Mr. Chelman and or the city's attorney that you weren't allowed to discuss that matter or consider that as part of your determination that night? I believe it was early on. It, the issue came up that uh, Attorney McCourt was at the meeting and explained that uh, Contamination, liability, legal stuff was not the planning board's concern, that we were to vote strictly on what was presented. Uh, but wasn't the lawsuit itself part of the package that was presented? Wasn't yes. information about Inf it in the information package? Information was, yes. Didn't, in fact, the city's technical advisory committee recommend that the planning board obtain or impose as a condition of approval the resolution of the cleanup responsibility? Yes, it was. Okay, so that was right, that was front and center in what you were asked to consider, correct? Yes, it was. Okay. And your reaction was energized, fair to say? Yes, it was. Okay. And you were frustrated, I fair was. to say? I was, yep. So uh, you voted against that particular project. What was the vote on that? It was eight to one. So you were, uh, as we say in Hanover, Vox Clamantis in Deserto. You were a voice crying in the wilderness on that one, right? <laughs> Fair to say? Fair to say. Um, did anybody at that meeting ask you to recuse from that vote? No. Did the, vo did the board vote to have you recuse? No. Was any appeal taken from that vote? No. Did the applicant or anyone move to rehear that issue? No. About 10 days after that meeting, you sent an email out, uh, which is in Exhibit 5, 
to members of the board and Mr. Chelman. It's on the second page. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it says, Dear Chair Chelman and Planning Board members, I just wanted to follow up with some information that I hope will help explain my somewhat zealous response to this project on October 19th. As you recall, I felt the application was incomplete as the Planning Board was not provided all the information it needed to make an informed decision on behalf of the people of Portsmouth. See below and attached. That was your opinion when you voted, right? Yes, it was. And your vote was in the can already, right? Yes. You were on the public record opposing this project because you felt it was an incomplete application, right? Correct. So none of this is not known to the public, right? Right. And are you asking the planning board when you send this email to uh, start a discussion about it? No. Are you asking them to make any decisions concerning this information? No. As you say in here, I hope it will help explain my somewhat zealous response, correct? Exactly. And did anyone from the planning board reply to this email? No. Okay. So no decision was made and no discussion was had concerning this email, correct? Correct. Until at least you got a principal's office letter from Mr. Chelman, right? Uh, yes, that's right. Okay. Okay, the last example of malfeasance that the city is alleging is contained here in Exhibit 6, and we've heard about it again at length from Mr. Chelman. Can you explain to me the background of this sequence of emails? Sure. Going back to the July 2023 planning board meeting. Yes. Uh... I believe on July 20th, the applicant came before the planning board in a work session, an informal, non-binding discussion of a project. And uh, at that time, the plans were presented, and uh, I had an opportunity to review them ahead of time. And two things concerned me. One was an encroachment, meaning that there was assets of the applicant's property on someone else's property. And uh, the fact that I believe that at the time they were proposing 72 apartments and only providing 64 parking spaces. And did you uh, provide that feedback to the applicant that night in July of 2023? Yes, I did. In fact, the applicant came uh, right over to the table, or I guess you were up here, but the applicant came up and you pointed out the encroachment right there, right? Right. I had a marked up plan, a paper copy, and when I explained it, he seemed a little unaware or just surprised, so he, he walked right up so he could see it with his own eyes. And uh, actually those were the, the very description that Mr. Chelman had of that very same interaction, correct? Correct, yes. And uh, you and the board, including Mr. Chelman, all agreed that this encroachment was an issue, right? Yes. And that the application couldn't be considered at all without resolving the encroachment, right? Right. So not a question of bias, it just was an application about building something on someone else's land, and that just isn't going to fly, right? It's not building. It was already existing, so I see. it's kind of the same thing. Okay, but approve, getting site plan approval for something that was on someone else's land isn't something that you can do as a board, right? Correct. Okay, and Mr. Chelman, as we heard last night, agrees with that, right? Right. Okay, so you told this applicant, hey, we want you to fix this, and please give us uh, parking data. Right? Yes. Okay. And then at some point in December, what did you learn? Yes, in December, I became aware that uh, this project was going before the TAC, which is the Technical Advisory Committee. It's a, a committee that reviews projects before they come to the planning board, and I was stunned to see that nothing had been done with the encroachment. It was just as it was in, in July. Um, and so when you wrote to the Technical Advisory Committee on 
December 27th, 2023, what were you trying to accomplish? I was just trying to make them aware of what happened in our work session and the fact that uh, they, the encroachment is still there and uh, I think it needs to be resolved. Okay. And then regarding the parking? And um, I had concerns about the, the number of apartments and what parking was going to be provided. And then what did you actually ask TAC to do with this information? I suggested, I never demanded or asked, I just suggested that the uh, encroachment be resolved and that an, uh, some type of parking demand analysis be prepared so that they can have some comfort that uh, the site will have adequate parking. And Mr. Shellman agreed that that was all fair game. That was legitimate information for the planning board to consider at the public meeting, right? Right. And you had already told the applicant about these things at the public meeting in July, right? Right. Um, and how did you react last night when Mr. Chelman kept uh, talking about you instructing TAC to do this or that? Yeah, that was, that didn't come off well for me because I never instructed anyone to do anything. It was, I had this knowledge and I just, I suggested that this, these activities take place. And nothing would have prevented you from asking for that data at the public hearing. Right. Right? Right. Um, and if the applicant knows in advance that that's what you're looking for as a board, doesn't it make it more likely that the application will be complete when it finally gets to you? Correct, yes. That's, that's kind of the goal, to have a complete, have everything resolved before it comes to the planning board. And that was the goal of the pre- uh, submission meeting that you had in July, right? Correct. And so isn't it fair to say that you were trying to help the applicant best prepare for the board's questions at the meeting? Yes. And is anything you asked for in here news to the applicant? No. Because they knew about it when you asked them in July, right? <laughs> That's right. And are you <clears throat> demanding that TAC undertake any kind of action or non-action as a result of your email? No. Did you even get a reply from this email? No. Okay. And uh, incidentally, is the July 20th, 2023 discussion captured in the city's video posting of that meeting, which is available on the city's website? Yes, it, uh, the, the encroachment issue is not reflected in the minutes, but it's definitely on the video. Okay, I'd like to make that video part of this record. Do you have any objection? No objection. Thank you. Um, and obviously Mr. Chelman testified to all of that last night. If there's a convenient time for a break. Uh, I'm almost done with this exhibit and then we can move on. Um, so uh, the facts that you asked TAC to consider in these emails, do they come from the July 20th, 2023 meeting? Yes. So you obtain the information that you asked TAC to consider as part of your duties as a board member, correct? C correct. Um, has anyone asked you to recuse yourself from this request by 581 Lafayette Road? No. Um, has the board voted to ask you to consider recusing yourself from that matter? No. Has a vote been taken on this issue by the planning board? No. Okay. Thank you. Um, I do have a couple more things, but uh, if you want to take a break, we can do that. Move could to we take have a, a five-minute ten-minute five minute recess.
Welcome back. Um, Attorney Eggleston, I'm just going to make a quick comment. Um, we've placed the uh, sign-up sheet for um, public comment at the back of the room. Again, um, if you signed up last night, you don't need to re-sign up. If you sign up again tonight, we're going to swear in everybody um, at the before public comment uh, occurs uh, again. Attorney Eggleston. Thank you. Mr. Hewitt, um, there are two exhibits in the file, uh, Exhibit O and Exhibit N. Um, looking first at O, what are we looking at here? Uh, this is a compilation of the Planning Board meeting minutes for 2022. And why did you, assist, well, let me ask you this. Did you put this compilation together? Yes. Okay. What was the purpose? Uh, I thought it would be interesting to know what my uh, attendance record was while I've been on the planning board. Okay. And what was your attendance in 2022? It, uh, uh, I attended all meetings. Okay. You didn't miss any meetings in 2022, correct? That's correct. Okay. And in 2023, I'm presenting you with our Exhibit N here. How many meetings did you miss in 2023? I missed, uh, I attended all planning board meetings and I missed uh, one work session. So there are a total of 19 meetings in 2022. I missed one of those. Okay. Um, now you heard some discussion from Mr. Chelman yesterday about uh, their dissatisfaction with the events surrounding your email to TAC and how uh, Mr. Chelman asked you to meet with him to talk about your status on the board. Can you just give your version of these events? Yes. Um, in early January, I think I believe it was January 4th, if that's a Friday, I got a text from the chair and he requested that we meet concerning the planning board. So we, uh, I responded I would, and we end up meeting at uh, a coffee shop in Portsmouth on Saturday. What did you discuss? At that meeting, he revealed to me that it was his job, or he's been asked to inform me that the city is going to remove me from the planning board. Can you explain why? Yes, he said that uh, the city has determined that uh, I've committed malfeasance. What was your reaction when you heard that? I was stunned. I just couldn't believe what I was hearing. Why? <laughs> I, I just uh, I, I couldn't believe that uh, I that they would want to do this. I just it was just I just couldn't get it. Has the revelation that the city was targeting you for malfeasance impacted you and your wife? Tremendously. It's been uh, probably the worst four weeks of my life and probably ten times worse for my wife. In what way? Well, being falsely accused of a crime is uh, something I don't wish on anybody to be dragged through this process in the press. As a volunteer, I just, I just couldn't, I just don't get it. Uh, did you ultimately meet with Mr. Chalman and the mayor? Yes, uh, based on our meeting at the coffee shop and uh, the fact that this was really happening, I, I only thought it was appropriate that I wanted to hear this, I wanted to discuss this with the mayor. And Rick felt that was fair, so uh, the chair arranged a meeting with the mayor on Tuesday afternoon, the following Tuesday, the 9th, I believe. And what transpired at that meeting? Well, the purpose, at least for me, I wanted to meet to hear it, to hear exactly why the city wanted to do this to me and what information they had explained to me specifically what was, you know, what, what I did that was so wrong to warrant this action. And uh, 
we discussed things and uh, Rick was mostly quiet. It was mostly discussion between myself and the mayor. And uh, he felt <clears throat> it was best for everyone <clears throat> that I just resign. So that's one option. That was one option. And the second option at the time was to go through what I'm going through now. Okay. And uh, I really felt it was way premature for the city to do this without hearing both sides of the story. And I, and I, I asked the mayor specifically, I said, you know, I, I realize that maybe I've done things that the city didn't like, but is, does the punishment fit the crime here? I mean, removal is a serious, serious consequence. And I just couldn't, I knew in my heart, I didn't do anything to warrant this. And I, I asked, uh, I asked the mayor at the time. I said, Mr. Mayor, do you believe that what I've done warrants removal? He looked me down and he said, Yes. Then I turned to the chair and I said, Rick, do you believe what I've done warrants removal? And he begged off. He said, I'm not getting into that. He just said, This is between myself and the mayor. So just quickly, that was, does this warrant this process, this removal process? <clears throat> well, so that goes to the question I was about to ask, which is having heard that testimony, Mr. Mayor, I would ask if you need to disqualify yourself in this matter, having predetermined that Mr. Hewitt needed to be removed. I do not believe so. I did not state that he were to be removed I repeated multiple occasions that there were two options, one of which being his resignation, the other which being the process that we're going through here, that ultimately as nine, we will decide whether or not he is ultimately uh, found in malfeasance and removed from office. Our objection is noted for the record on that point. So after uh, that meeting, Mr. Hewitt. Well, let me ask this. How did that meeting conclude? I, I told them I cannot make a decision until I see in writing what exactly I did to warrant this. I, I felt they accused me of malfeasance. I said, well, I want to see some evidence. I want to see specifics. And that would help me decide whether, in fact, um, I should resign. Maybe, maybe you know, I just didn't have anything other than their word. So um, I requested that they produce evidence of my malfeasance, and they resisted. And uh, I said, oh, then I'll think about it. And then did you leave the city hall? Yes, I left. Okay. Um, what happened next? Sometime that evening, I received a text from the chair who had... Mr. Chelman? Yes, Mr. Chelman, that he was hopeful a third option would be available to have me stay on the board and that uh, he would tell me that option in the, in, in the morning. And uh, the next morning, I received a text that... or. I'm not sure exactly how it was communicated, but I, I learned that uh, he was going to try to see if the city would agree to let me stay on the board if I signed a confession, a combination confession resignation letter that would be left undated to be held with the chair and that that would allow me to stay on the board. So he was going to run that by the city and uh, see if that would be acceptable. And as he testified last night, he wasn't even sure if that was legal, right? Right, that's right. And uh, so, and I think as he testified, the idea would be that in his discretion, if you should, in his discretion, warrant uh, removal, 
he would basically file your resignation letter with the city and you'd be off the board, correct? That's correct, yes. <clears throat> Showing you the city's Exhibit 7. So there's an attachment. The last document in this packet is a letter dated January 11, 2024. And in it, you ask the city to provide a written document itemizing uh, the reasons and evidence justifying the request for resignation. Fair to say? That's fair to say. How, just give me the story behind this letter. Well, it goes into what I just said about having a better understanding of what I did that was so wrong. And uh, I just felt it was only fair that uh, they produce evidence against me so I could understand it. So I wanted it in writing. And how did it get to City Hall? Uh, it was conveyed, actually my wife had to come to my work, I printed it out, I signed it, she went back to Portsmouth and hand delivered it to the city clerk's office, or the okay. city manager's office, I'm not sure. And then the response to the letter is approximately uh, 121 p.m. on January 11th from Mr. Chelman, copying the mayor and attorney Morrill. Correct. And then the mayor weighed in himself uh, that evening, correct? Yes, he did, later on. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it was at that point that they were putting the memorandum into the city packet for consideration at the public hearing and you had never seen it before, is that right? Right, I mean, the, the time frame I was operating under was very condensed. I mean, I, f I found out, I met with the mayor and the chair on Tuesday. Um, I believe the extortion resignation letter was prepared on Wednesday. Um, and then I had Thursday to make up my mind because if I didn't make up my mind, they were going to produce the removal instruction in the packet for the city council on Friday morning. Okay. Um, and I asked you a little bit about this earlier, but uh, specifically, uh, in the past month since you've been threatened with resignation and removal and all these other things, have you had trouble sleeping? Yes. How about your wife? Very much. Have there been tears in your household? Quite a few. Yeah. Have you felt emotionally harmed by this? That's fair to say. How's your reputation been in the community? Um, I think it's holding up based on the people behind me. Are you concerned, however, that an allegation of malfeasance might trail you with those who don't know you? Oh, yes, I do. And Yes. <clears throat> That's all the questions I have for Mr. Hewitt. Mr. Hewitt, are you prepared to go on? Yes. Break? No problem. Uh, I might ask for like two minutes with my client. Is that okay? Two minute recess or five minute recess? Just so I can speak. Sure. Five minute recess.
Welcome back, Attorney Morrell. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I want to start sort of at the end, Mr. Hewitt, of what you were discussing. And you said that you had a meeting with Mr. Chelman, the chairperson of the planning board, at a coffee shop. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And um, during that conversation, you discussed uh, a number of matters, including some emails you had sent to the technical advisory committee, correct? Yes. And Mr. Chelman made it very clear to you at that point he was concerned about the content of those emails and the process by which they were sent to TAC, correct? He, he expressed his concern, yes. Okay. So you, he did let you know that that was part of the basis for the concern and, and the suggestion that perhaps you should resign, correct? He, in, he intimated that those he had concerns about those emails and he thought that this was part of why the city considered this malfeasance, yes. Okay. And going back to the issues from the Banfield Road project, um, you had received a letter from Mr. Chelman about the emails um, mm. that you had sent to the planning board about the Banfield Road project, correct? Yes, I, I received an email from him, yes. Well, he sent you a letter, right? Oh, yeah, that's right. It was an email with attached letter, yes. Yeah. Okay. And he, he told you in that letter that he was concerned about the email that you had sent to the planning board, particularly because it was during the appeal period, correct? Yes, and that, that was news to me. So I was glad the chair sent that because before that letter I was completely unaware a 30-day appeal period existed. Well, you have sat on votes for rehearings within a 30-day appeal period in the past, right? For the planning board matters, you've had requests for rehearings within that appeal period. Yes, but I didn't. I didn't make that connection between requesting a rehearing and an appeal period where something like Banfield Road. I didn't make that connection. But you know, as part of being on the planning board, that once the decision is made, there's still other action that might happen, whether it's the butters challenge the vote of the planning board or the applicant challenges the vote of the planning board, correct? Again, at Banfield Road, I, I was anxious to get my feelings to the board. And I figured, hey, I have this opportunity. It's, it's 11 days after the vote, I, so that's why I sent it out. So. That was a learning experience for me, and uh, that's the only way I can explain it. Okay. Well, you, you had made your feelings pretty clear at the meeting. I think you discussed that with your attorney here just a few minutes ago, that you were, you know, pretty <clears throat> strong in your views and, and pretty outspoken during the meeting. That's correct. Okay. So in addition to... Uh, letter from Mr. Chelman about the Banfield Road um, email, you also received a letter f from me in regards to that Banfield Road, correct? Yes. Okay. And I'm just referring to something that's in the record in what's called Attachment A for the city's documentation. You're familiar with that? Exhibit A. It goes with the charging document. Take a look. Okay. Go ahead. Does he have a copy in front of you? I'm going to give it to him. So this is a letter, and correct me if I'm wrong, was dated November 9th of 2023, um, addressed to you from myself. Okay. Is that correct? Yes. And you're familiar with that letter? Yes. And that letter sets out a number of reasons of concern that the city has about the emails that you sent to Banfield Road and and prior conduct, correct? Okay, yes. So there are a number of things listed in there that were of concern. Mm. And then at the coffee shop, you also learn that there's concern about the new event, the December and January emails to the mm. Technical Advisory Committee, right? Correct. And in addition to that, 
like a year prior, you had also received a letter from Attorney Sullivan and from the chairperson, Mr. Chelman, telling you that they had concerns about your conduct on the planning board, correct? Yes. Okay. And prior to July of 2022, you know, from the time you took office in January of 2022, to those letters going out in July, you had received a number of emails from uh, Attorney Sullivan in regards to your role as a planning board member and being careful that you stayed within the bounds of that role, correct? He sent me several emails, yes. Okay. So there had been an accumulation of issues that had been discussed with you over the period of almost two years. Yes, there have been emails to me sent by the attorney. Okay. The emails, the letters from Mr. Chelman, the letters from the city attorney, and the most recent letter in November of 2023 from, from myself to you, and a letter from Mr. Chelman at the same time about Banfield Road. And then you sat down and you talked with Mr. Chelman at the coffee shop about the emails that you sent to the Technical Advisory Committee. Okay, yeah. So you're aware of there were many concerns leading up to that conversation at the coffee shop, correct? Correct. correct. So when you had a chance to um, speak again with Mr. Chelman and the mayor, you acknowledged that those emails that you had sent to TAC um, were inappropriate and that you shouldn't have done it. Isn't no, that correct? I, I wouldn't say that, no. So you heard Mr. Chelman testify to that or provide evidence to that yesterday um, that you had indicated that you understood that those emails were not appropriate and that you shouldn't have done it. He might have said that, but I don't believe it. Okay. Um, so you also know that Mr. Chelman kind of went out of his way to find an alternate solution to this issue um, instead of resignation from the board or removal from the board, that there's an alternate. If you would, again, acknowledge that the emails that you sent to TAC um, were wrong, that shouldn't have been sent, that that would lead the way to avoiding any of this hearing or having to resign? Well, again, I, Chair Chelman believes my emails were wrong and constituted a, a step to malfeasance. I wasn't sure of that. I'm not an attorney. That's why I wanted this information in writing so I could ask somebody about that. So, um, so what I'm saying is you had that information in writing from a letter in November from myself, you had a letter from Mr. Chelman in November, you had letters from the previous July, you had a number of emails um, indicating why your conduct was not conforming to the rules of the planning board. Again, that's the city's opinion. Right, but those are, you had a list of what the city believed was uh, inappropriate behavior. Correct. So, um, now I just want to ask you a couple of questions um, about um, some of the exhibits you've talked about. And in those emails to TAC, you sent two, right? You sent one at the end of December? Yes. And then you sent another one in January of this year? Right. Okay. And um, you were actually angry that the applicant hadn't addressed the concerns that you brought up at your pre-application meeting when you talked about the encroachment and the parking concerns. I was concerned that my uh, issues raised in July that, that uh, the city would even accept those plans. Why would the city accept plans that uh, the planning board had made recommendations to change? So. The plans coming before TAC are there for their review, for their consultation, for their um, <clears throat> advice 
to the planning board, correct? Yes, but why, why did the planning department even accept them? Okay. But they hadn't ha even had a chance to go through that process when you sent the emails, correct? It had been submitted uh, again to the planning. So the planning staff had seen those plans. And why didn't the planning staff reject them is my issue. And that is a question you could have asked at the planning board hearing and not in emails to text. I just figured so, why not nip it in the bud. But that was really your intention is you wanted them to change course, to act differently. Well, I wanted, I wanted that information to be reflected in the plans. I wanted them to be as complete and as compliant as possible. So, I also want to talk to you about um, the um, 710 Mill Road project and your emails to Vincent Hayes, who is the compliance um, person in the planning department, correct? Yes. Okay. And it's his job to go through the planning board decisions and to ensure that all these conditions, some of which can be very complex, have been met before building permit is issued, correct? Okay. You agree? I th understand if you tell me that's his job, yes. Okay. Well, you've been told that that's his job. And in fact, Beverly Zent sent that to you in an email, right? That it's his job to go through the conditions from the planning board decisions? Potentially, I'm, I'm not aware. Council, if you're going to ask him about emails, can you put one in front of him? Yeah, well, we have them in the exhibits um, in regards to exhibit three. Let's see. I think I'll use mine. I'll use mine. Okay, so it's in regards to 710 Mill Road, and it's in Exhibit 4, and it's um, on page 4 of an email chain um, from Beverly to you, Mr. Hewitt, um, in response to your email to Mr. Hayes, dated July 7th of 2022. And in that email, um, she talks to you about uh, Mr. Hayes and that he's professional and that he works to make sure that the projects are in compliance. Is that what that email says up here? Sure. made you aware that that was specifically his job to work on that in regards to any of your concerns about compliance, okay. correct? Uh, yeah. Okay. So, um, Right. 
I also want to talk to you again about um, the Banfield Road project, and there are minutes from that planning board meeting in October, October 19th of 2022, um, provided by your council. Exhibit I, I believe. Exhibit I. Yeah. Okay. And on page five of those minutes, um, I think we talked about this paragraph before. It starts with Mr. Hewitt asked. And uh, in the center there, it, the minutes account for Mr. or Attorney McCourt's advice in regards to the contamination at Banfield Road. And he, in fact, said that the city was working towards the same goal. Um, and whether the site plan or subdivision plan was approved, it would have an impact, it would not have an impact on the amount of liability shifted to the Portsmouth taxpayers. Do you recall him saying that? I've highlighted it and bracketed it there. Okay. So we did address your concerns during that meeting, correct? Yes, that, uh, well, not all my concerns. I mean, if I was still concerned that, uh, that the tax requirement that uh, that we address was just dismissed. I, I had concerns about that, and uh, but you know that that dismissal. Um, are you talking about the dismissal on Banfield Road or some other project? No, on uh, tax uh, had requested that the planning. I believe the wording was that the planning boards. The site liability had been determined prior as a condition of planning board approval. And you were advised that the litigation and the liability for the cleanup there was a separate issue. Well, that's what M Attorney McCourt said, but uh, <coughs> I felt that it's uh, if, if TAC had recommended it, it's the, it ultimately it's the planning board decision, I think not city staff so I want to go back now to um, your early um, your earliest meeting I think was January 27 22 yes 2022 and that's all in um, exhibit um, your exhibit a I believe I don't know if you still have it up here. You not. Um, but in the minutes of the meeting, which I don't know if we have a page. It's not paginated, but it appears to be the next to the last page of the minutes mm -hmm. from which, Exhibit A. For which meeting? January 27th, okay. 2022. Mm -hmm. okay. So at that first meeting that you attended as a planning board member, there was actually a request for a rehearing for a project at 203 Maplewood Avenue and 1 Rains Avenue. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. Okay. And um, you actually voted on that to have a rehearing, correct? Yes. Okay. But it was the following meeting where the rehearing was supposed to occur that Attorney Sullivan came in and, and advised some legal action had been taken and therefore no rehearing would occur. That's right. So just generally, um, just for the record, we have a lot of documents up here. Um, you familiarized yourself with the email correspondence included within the city packet, correct? You're talking about rains? All of them. All, All of the emails things. in here. Yeah. Oh, yes, I am familiar. Okay. 
And those are from you when it says Jim or Jim Hewitt. Those are your emails. Right. Okay. And um, <clears throat> I think that that's all I have for questions. Okay, great. I have a couple questions on the... <coughs> here so I don't need the mic. <clears throat> Council just asked you about the Rains Avenue motion for rehearing, which was 127.22, correct? That's correct. And um, you weren't alone in voting to rehear that project, correct? No, yeah, it was a 5-4 vote. Okay. And um, had you decided at that point how you were going to vote on the substance of the rehearing if you came to hear it? No. Okay. Hmm. <clears throat> and uh, one of the issues that the motion for rehearing raised was uh, the legality of the prior vote with respect to the presence of a particular board member, correct? That was part of it, yes. Okay. And so that had a, a legal bearing that had nothing to do with the technical aspects of the project, right? Right. Um, but it nevertheless would have given an applicant a, a basis for appealing the decision, right? Correct. So wouldn't it be sensible to rehear the issue so as to eliminate that? Yes. Legal problem from consideration? Correct, yep. Okay. Was that one of the reasons why you decided to rehear that case? It was one of the reasons. Um, again, uh, I had, part of it also had to do with the status of those contaminated properties. Okay. Um, and that was the information that, they, that you then sought from the planning department, That's correct? Right. Yes. Okay. That's all that I have for Mr. Hewitt. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Eggleston. So next, um, and you do not have any further witnesses. I have no further witnesses. Thank you. Um, are there questions for Mr. Hewitt? Your Honor, I have a few. Uh, Councilor Bullock. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Hewitt, it's unfortunate uh, we've gotten to this point. Um, I, the, you, you stated you were familiar with the emails included in the packet. Um, I just want to confirm, on February 16th, you emailed the Con Conservation Commission um, regarding information on 1 Rains Ave, 31 Rains Ave, and 203 Maplewood Avenue? Correct, yeah. Um, then on March 15th, you emailed all the planning board members. Um, correct. Mark, if what was on the March fifteenth? You emailed all the planning board members. Mm -hmm. What was the top? Yeah, I I can't say if I did. I, I, I it's included in Exhibit Three. Right. The is there a topic you can help me out with? Yeah, I think you've done some. Um, some was that parking? Was that the parking email? The, f the March fifteenth. I bring it right here. Councilor, um, we would certainly stipulate that any email that has his email out address on it is what he said okay I just wanted to ask him confirm that he sent them to the planning board members I just that's all I'm asking um, and on July 13th um, you sent or sorry July 14th and 15th you emailed uh, Vincent Hayes and CC the chair of the planning board yes I did I did that on purpose to be more transparent about my activities with the with the status of my neighbors uh, con approval conditions um, and then on October 30th, you sent an email to the chair and all the planning board members uh, referring information on 375 Banfield Road? Yes. Uh, if you say, I mean, like my attorney said, if my name is on an email and I send it. Okay. Uh, um, and then Max. on December 27th, you emailed the site plan review technical advisory committee about uh, 581 Lafayette Road. And then on January 4th, you emailed the TAC um, again about 581 Lafayette Road. Yep. Okay. Sounds right. That's all I have. Councilor Moreau. Um, Mr. Hewitt, if you could just let us know, because I believe it's practice of all elected and appointed officials to the city that they go to the city clerk's office before serving and they have a oath of office that you take and you sign a book. Did you do that before? you started on the planning board? 
No. Okay. He did sign the oath of office book. I would have to check what date it was, but he did sign the oath of office book. Oh, I'm sorry. I, That's okay. I thought it had to be done every year. Nope, just once you're appointed and uh, reappointed. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was Not way back year. two years ago. I'm sorry. I did do that. Okay. Any other questions, Councillor Tabor and Assistant Mayor? Uh, thanks, Your Honor. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Hewitt, um, none of us want to be here, but we're doing our best here. Um, in the case where you asked Beverly Zent to put material in the packet. Um, Councillor Moreau recalled the chairman saying at the start of um, your term of office and his that material to be put into the packet should uh, go through him. Do you recall that? No. I thought if I had interest in having material in a packet, I should send it to the planning director. And the uh, <clears throat> next question I'd have would be, uh, when you wrote to the Conservation Commission, uh, did any of those members respond to you by email or in person? No. And did they, in fact, um, take up your concern about the environmental permits? The, uh, as I recall, the CONCOM chair forwarded the, my email to city staff. And uh, when you emailed the TAC um, and suggesting that the TAC require parking demand data. I didn't say require. I said suggested. You suggested, according to the test, that the TAC would require the applicant to provide. Right. It's a suggestion to them to add, yeah, to require them to, to produce some parking information, right. yeah. Yes, a suggestion for a requirement. Um, did any of the TAC members <laughs> reply to you? No. And did the TAC act on that at all? Not to my knowledge. Okay. Um, And uh, in the case of Banfield Road, you put up your best-spirited argument about the pollution. Mm. Um, did you um, – the result was that it was an eight-to-one vote. Um, and – you felt that additional information, if I can, would it be fair to say you felt you wanted to follow up on that with additional information? I, I just felt there was not enough information presented to the planning board to make an informed decision. Right. That's why I voted against it. Um, did you consider the vote of the planning board that night to be a definitive action or not? It was an eight to one vote, but my follow up email was just, uh, I felt I owed the board a reason for my behavior when I voted against it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I think, and yet what you're saying is in your, just now, is that you still doubted that the application was complete. Yes, I still do. In spite of the planning board's vote. Well, there's eight people that think differently than I do. Right. Okay. Um, those are my questions. Thanks. Councilor Tabor, Assistant Mayor. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Mr. Hewitt, I just have some questions for clarification. Um, before you were appointed to Planning Board, had you ever emailed Vincent Hayes as a as a citizen? No. 
before you got on planning board, had you ever submitted anything to the CIP before? Yes. So you knew the process? Not through the portal. Okay. And how did you submit it before? I can't recall whatever setup they had. Um, so they had different options. The viewpoint portal was new, or at least it was new to me. Okay. Um, a question. Um, you just confirmed uh, through Councillor Tabor's question that your answers went to, to other committees or boards or TAC um, or to planning board went unanswered was, by the majority, correct? Could you, I don't, could you give specifics on which emails went, went unanswered? It, it would seem uh, in the exhibits before you, uh, and as touched on, did your emails from TAC get a reply back? Oh, no, not, not on 581 Lafayette, no response. Did your emails uh, sent to the um, Conservation Commission receive replies? About which site? Uh, any that were submitted in exhibit? No, no one responded to me. Did your emails that were sent to other planning board members receive replies that are in exhibit? Again, there's been so many, I can't. The ones oh, in just submitted in, here? in exhibit, not, yes. Not that I recall, no. Um, why do you believe you never received any response? I have no idea. You have no idea. Okay. That is all I have. Thank you, Assistant Mayor. Uh, Councilor Lombardi. Um, I have a question for Attorney Eagleton. Yes, is sir. That all right, right now? No, okay. Um, throughout your presentations, you uh, referred to the what it qualifies as um, being a meeting, and um, you stated that um, there would either be a quorum or a vote. And using the word "or" to me means one or the other, but you implied and or actually insisted that. That meant both. No, no, it's disjunctive. Or is disjunctive and is conjunctive. So it can be either or. Right. So when it says decision or discussion, either one constitutes a meeting. Okay? Exactly. So but we're all on the same page there. However, if we are going to discuss this now, I was going to save this for argument, but. Uh, well, if we could save it for argument, then that would be great. Well, it's pertinent to Mr. Lombardi's direct question goes beyond that. I'm, I'm answering his question, and I think right now is the time to talk about this. Time to talk about, sorry, Lombardi's, <clears throat> so, uh, Council so, Lombardi's question was whether or not it's and or. Is that the question? Yes, but that what thinking? constitutes a meeting is his, his overarching oh, question. Uh, before you, you get into that, I was going to ask uh, Attorney Lachlan uh, to uh, bring his deficient, definition of a, a meeting and whether or not a, to keep it out of to, for the council that for us um, understood to give I, I was going to refer to attorney Laughlin's material that he produced for us. Well, we're today. saving some time then. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, uh, attorney Laughlin, the question is whether or not a, uh, email, uh, uh, to a quorum of a body is a, uh, considered a meeting in and of itself. Okay. Let me answer that. And I, um, I was asked a question yesterday, um, or came up um, as to what constitutes a meeting. And um, so this afternoon I went back to do some research on, on that topic. And, um, uh, and it turns out that um, I've, I've written kind of extensively on that matter. And uh, I, I, I know that I'm a... Um, uh, elderly grandfather that sometimes forgets things. Um, but um, I've, um, um, I, I don't recall everything that I've written. And this is, this is one of the volumes, uh, 104. And uh, <coughs> there's a section in here that deals directly with this and the topic of what constitutes a meeting. And um, the... Um, in this book, and it's it's 
my material, uh, so you can take it or leave it. For, but it says, <clears throat> to answer the question as to whether the exchange of emails among a quorum of, public, of a public body could be found to constitute a meeting, it is necessary to examine the definition of a meeting in RSA 91A21. Again, and I'm quoting um, Cordell Johnson, uh, who was at the Municipal Association at the time. His article provides a framework for conducting the analysis, noting that there are four elements in the definition of meeting. A, convening. B, a quorum or majority of the members of the public body. C, in a manner that such that all participating members are able to communicate with each other contemporaneously. D, for the purpose of discussing or acting upon matters over which the body has supervision, control, jurisdiction, or advisory power. If all four elements are present, there is a meeting. Notice must be posted and it must be open to the public, and minutes must be kept and made available to the public. If any one of the conditions are not present, however, there is no meeting, as the requirements for a meeting do not apply. A sequential exchange of emails by members of a public body will generally not represent a convening uh, of the body since uh, they are not all in one location. And it goes on that email exchanges among even a quorum of a public body will not generally constitute a meeting uh, requiring 24 hours notice and minutes. And there's been some confusion on this. Origin at one point, there was a um, uh, Superior Court decision that said that exchange of emails was um, a meeting. And um, uh, a couple years later, uh, that, that was a, the legislature addressed that, and, and uh, Cordell Johnson, who I'm quoting in this book, uh, lays out when it's a um, when it's a meeting. When it's a, they're all pub they're public documents when you send uh, a, uh, a document to other members of the planning board, but they're, they're, it's not necessarily a meeting. One of the examples, um, if one member of a planning board sends an email to the rest of the board about a proposed zoning amendment, uh, regardless of when he, whether any member responds or whether there's any discussion, the email is a government record. Uh, but then that, so <coughs> next step is, is it a meeting? And um, what I, uh, when I found this, I felt an obligation to disclose it, um, that uh, let, uh, uh, I didn't want it to be, come out that you, hey, you said this in your book and, um, uh, and you didn't clear up the question from last night, so that's what I wanted to do that. Mr. Laughlin, I'd like to circulate Cordell Johnson's uh, framework that you uh, just talked about, which was included in his material from the New Hampshire Municipal Association, which guides boards and municipalities in trying to determine whether a sequence of electronic communications constitute a meeting. And I understand council has an objection to this for various different reasons, but this is an NHMA uh, document prepared by Mr. Johnson um, for exactly that purpose. Do you see any issue with accepting the document? No, and I think that uh, from what I understand from our discussion earlier, uh, that the city attorney has some questions about the wording of it, but um, I think introducing it, let the council see it. So that's right. I was just going to point out, and um, I think we agreed. I think we agreed that the wording in the diagram is not the same wording as the language in the statute, and there's a critical difference in the language. Um, if I could have a copy. So um, in this diagram it talks about are the communications used to discuss matters over which the body has supervision control or advisory power but that's not the language of the statute the language of the statute is are the communications for the purpose of discussing or acting upon a matter or matters over which 
the public body has supervision and in legal terms the the language is very important what did the legislature use they use the language for the purpose of discussing or acting upon a matter or matters so to the extent that this diagram is helpful to anybody keep in mind that the language used is not the language in the statute noted I just want to pass it to Councilor Cook she can pass it down the line Your Honor, can I ask Attorney Lachlan a question? Certainly. Um, That's what he's here for. And I, I remember this from training, so I, I don't remember the date exactly, but I do believe probably in the 2008-2010 time frame, wasn't the RSA 91A adjusted specifically in regards to email? Yes. And was your, uh, the passage that you just read, would that be before or after? No, that would be, because that reflects the, um, uh, it, 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 let me just, the um, this section. Um, Do we have two more of these? So the law, the, um, I, I, I talk about the Superior Court case that caused most municipal lawyers and, and board members um, difficulty. And this is in 2008, um, amendments to RSA 91A provided guidance to public officials. Um, laws of 2008, Chapter 303, define governmental records as follows. Any information created, accepted, or obtained by or on behalf of any public body or a, or a quorum or majority thereof or any public agency in furtherance of its official function, um, and referring to a government record, without limiting the foregoing, the term governmental records includes any written communications or other information, whether in paper or electric, <clears throat> electronic or other physical forms, received by a quorum or a majority of the public body in furtherance, furtherance of its official function, whether at a meeting or outside meeting of the body. Um, so it's a public, it's a governmental body, they clarified. Um, <clears throat> then um, uh, the, that goes on to uh, what I, I read about uh, to answer the question as to whether an exchange of emails among a quorum uh, could be found to constitute a meeting, it is necessary to examine the, exi the definition of a meeting. And um, that's when I, I cited the ABCD that uh, Cordell Johnson uh, taught. You wrote a, an article in, the, in a continuing legal education booklet, um, <coughs> 2000 and well, I think. You know, I can ask a follow-up? Because um, I, I think this is a pretty critical distinction. So um, that being said, I believe you said the of the A, B, C, and D, it was the quorum wasn't met. And the reason the quorum isn't met is because there's no physical, uh, because electronically they're not physically in the same present, presence. Um, yes. Yep. And is that based on the fact, and this is like we ran into it in COVID, in order to have a meeting, even if some attendees attend by Zoom or telephone, you always have to have a physical quorum present because that's a key New Hampshire requirement. I, I think, and I think that's, um, it's, it's, yes, it is, but it, it's a little bit different than, um, um, well, it was, I, I, the reason that was, I assumed, an act was because, um, it was hard to get, um, it was difficulty getting quorums. And, uh, but um, this, this, this article um, in the, the writing, and I, I called Cordell Johnston, 
um, who is, has taken over the writing of, of these volumes for me and, uh, and asked him about, about the, what I've written here and, um, um, and, and a little bit of the background of the whole thing. And, and he, he said, no, they, that was his understanding and as to what I've written about email exchanges uh, not generally constituting a meeting. Okay, thank you. Councillor Cook. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I have a question for Mr. Hewitt. Um, thank Mr. You. Hewitt, do you have water? Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> thank you for being patient and Kate. listening to all of our questions. Uh, okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Hear, yeah. Thank you for being patient and taking all of our questions. Um, so my question is about um, the December 11th, 2021 email before you, after you were voted in as a planning board member, but before you were um, sitting as a planning board member in January, um, where you said specifically um, to a group of individuals, as you may be aware, this is qu quoting, as you may be aware, City Hall and the developer of Rains Avenue, in parentheses, De Lorenzo, have plans to build another monster in the North Mill Pond, 100-foot wetlands buffer at Rains Avenue. See planning board agenda here. And then the email goes on. Um, were you warned about this email and fairness by legal counsel um, before you took office officially? Yeah, the, uh, Attorney Sullivan sent me an email having concerns about that private email that inadvertently got to City Hall's hands. Okay. When the planning board then, which you were sitting on, um, met on January 27th, 2022, um, and voted to rehear the case on uh, Rains Avenue, was this the same Rains Avenue that you were referring to? in this email in December? Yes, it was. After receiving that warning, is there a reason why you didn't recuse yourself on that vote? I saw no, I felt no reason to recuse. Okay. Um, and my other question may be for legal counsel as a follow on to this. Um, were any of the individuals that were included on this email chain in December party to the legal action that then limited the planning board's discussion of Rains Avenue? So in, trying Is to make that a sure question everybody directed can, to Attorney no, Murrow? No, it's directed to Attorney Murrow. Yeah, sorry. That's the way I took it. <laughs> there you go. So as I understand your question, it's the email goes out to 105 Bartlett appellants. Correct. Right. And you're, those are all the individuals who were involved in the litigation um, in regards to that particular property. Right. Was that your question? Um, my question is actually, were any of those individuals involved in the legal action that, um, that limited discussion of Rains Avenue um, later, so the planning board voted. My understanding is January 27th to rehear, but then it wasn't reheard because there was legal action. Correct. It was. And do I know if those people are the same appellants in the other matters? I do not know the answer to that question. Or if any of them are. Right. I believe um, Attorney McCallum is involved um, in many of those matters, but I can't say for sure. If in every single one of these. And I guess then my other question is, is in that legal matter, was this email raised or the vote of the planning board on January 27th? Not that I'm rehear. aware of, no. And not, not that it's documented in the, um, okay. in the minutes of January 27th meeting okay. that I've identified at this point, okay. um, that this was raised as a concern. Okay, thank you. And then I have a follow on for Mr. Hewitt on a different subject. Certainly. Um, so 
Mr. Hewitt, um, my understanding from the testimony yesterday from uh, Chair Chelman was that you have gone through extensive um, planning board training from the New Hampshire Municipal Association and also through the planning board certification process. Is that accurate? I wouldn't call it extensive. Okay. Can you describe that training for me? I believe in March of 2022, uh, an attorney from the New Hampshire Municipal Association came and spoke with us about the very basics of being on the planning board. Okay. And through the planning board certification process? Yeah, that was an online thing, and uh, frankly, I felt uh, it was so basic that I even forgotten that I completed it. So it was, it was the most um, elementary uh, aspects of being a planning board member. Did you have specifically training on the quasi-judicial nature of the planning board or the juror standard? I'm sure uh, Attorney Buckley had mentioned that okay. at some point. Okay. And so after Chair Chelman um, warned you in July of 2022 and then again in I believe you received a second warning in November of 2023 about your responsibilities as, as a planning board member and in regards to violations of either RSA 91A or the juror standard in fairness. Um, why did you proceed to take similar actions again December 27th and again January 4th? So I I felt and I continue to feel that was not a violation of the jury standard. Okay. I was presenting public information that had already been made public to TAC. And do you have any legal training as an attorney? No. Okay. So, um, so were you getting legal advice from outside counsel outside of the city's legal department? No. Okay, so, um, but you believe that your understanding of the law was more accurate than the city's legal department understanding or the understanding of Chair Chelman? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Quick follow up to that, um, uh, Attorney Lachlan. Uh, do you believe it creates um, any uh, difficulties when a planning board member emails? suggestions to an advisory board that the information coming back to the planning board would would that constitute uh, any bias I think that from throughout this entire um, matter the concern of the legal department reflected in these emails was um, creating the appearance of in, not indifference and um, that uh, even on, on the emails, the exchange of emails, I think it was uh, Chairman Kelman, Chairman Chelman yesterday said, where, said his worry was that you send out an email and it, um, there's people respond to it and that clearly is when you want, that crosses the line if there were responses. And um, um, and that's uh, and one of the other things in here. And this, let me quote this. Another paragraph: If the exchange of sequential emails has the flavor of deliberations, it would be a violation of RSA 91A22, which provides that communications outside the meeting shall not be used to circumvent the spirit and and purpose of the right to know law as expressed in 91A1. And so I, I think the, the idea of um, uh, these emails, I think, and a lot of this, the concern of the legal department was the impression being created uh, by, by um, the conveyance of some of this information. And is that, is, and they, they were, I think they were trying to address um, uh, whether any, in this case, Mr. Uh, Hewitt was, in fact, uh, impartial or would appear to be impartial to a, 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 a um, independent judge knowing all the facts. 
Okay, so the question is not whether or not the email itself uh, to a, uh, a planning board member could email, in your opinion, uh, the technical advisory committee um, as long as the tone of the email didn't lend itself to the appearance of anything other than indifference. The, I think there were two concerns. One was the email with the, when the people receiving it, um, uh, to the extent if it was a, um, a um, board that has to operate under the juror standard, that that would trigger discussions outside of the meeting. And um, I forget what was the second part of the question. Uh, that, uh, well, now I've forgotten it. But I think it was a concern, uh, or we asked if just was the email itself. Um, Correct. An email to TAC itself, an advisory board to the planning board, uh, would that uh, uh, raise the question of a lack of indifference? I think it, I, I think it would be, I think it would raise the question. It would, uh, it would be, a, you have to look at it and say, does this appear that this, individual uh, is um, indifferent on that and and we can debate whether he had a right to do it or, um, or not but uh, I think the, the thrust of the city's um, concern was the creation of the appearance that um, this person wasn't indifferent. Mr. Hewitt, um, thank you again for testimony here today. Um, do you believe uh, it is your responsibility as a planning board member to appear indifferent towards applications that come across the planning board's desk. Not only not appear, to be indifferent. I just can't have the appearance. I must be indifferent. Do you think that there are any limitations to what you can uh, do with regard to uh, the appearance of a lack of indifference given that other people could look at your words differently than you mean to intend them? Very much so. People interpret language how they interpret language, so it's individual. Do you believe then that sending emails to TAC with suggestions on requirements uh, could be read by somebody that believes that there is a lack of indifference from you on a specific project? If that's their choice, but uh, if they can misrepresent that. When you say misrepresent that, do you think misrepresent your lack of indifference? No, misrepresent how that information is supposed to be perceived. Do you believe that as a planning board member staff could potentially treat you differently in the context of questions that you have on a butters? No. They sh I should say they shouldn't. I mean, if, if I'm an abutter, they should treat me as an abutter, period. Do you see where sending an email where one yourself has stated that it was for an abundance of caution that including uh, the chair of the planning board along with the planning <clears throat> department director could appear <clears throat> to others outside yourself as requesting information as a member of the planning board that would not be available to other people I, as I, citizens. I can't, I can't predict how other people are going to perceive that, but my intention <laughs> on sending emails to Vincent and copying the director and the chair was transparency. So I wanted to be sure they knew that if they had concerns, I wasn't doing this on the sly. I wanted to be out in the open that I had a concern with my abutter. Do you think having sent the email, uh, it would have been important to note that you were doing so as a citizen? Uh, on now, today, certainly. I okay. didn't then. Do you think that there are any 
uh, newly adopted rules of the planning board that would cause you to engage differently with both the planning department now uh, and other members of the uh, the the other um, committees of the city of Portsmouth. Yeah, the, I believe they were adopted in January. The new planning board rules. So I think there are, there are different than they are when the last two years. One of those being to email Chairman Shellman or the chair of the planning board uh, with any request for information <clears throat> to be included in the packet. Is that a rule that? That's a new rule. Is that a rule that uh, you would? Uh, abide by uh, in the future. I, I will abide by all planning board rules, the new rules. <clears throat> That's all the questions that I have. Can the witness be discharged? Any other questions? He may. Thank you, Mr. Hewitt. We now uh, move on to, I believe, just got a, papers are piling up. Um, All right. Public comment. We have public comment. Do we have a list of the public comment participants? I oh, great. June is bringing this up. Thank you. Okay. Um, do you? Uh, so we're going to have everybody uh, because there's new additions. Um, everybody stand uh, and be sworn in by uh, Kelly that wishes to speak. Or City Clerk Barnaby. Do you state your name? I do. That the testimony I am about to give. The testimony I'm about to give. Will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Upon the pains and penalties of perjury. Upon the pains and penalties of perjury. Thank you. Thank you. And is everybody that just stood up signed up here? <coughs> What's that? Okay. Um, Elizabeth, I will make a note uh, and put you at the end. Okay. Um, is anybody else? You're on the list. Okay. Uh, we have three minutes uh, on this. Attorney Lachlan, do you know how to work that machine or you need I'm a refresher? Try. Try. Okay. Um, I'd ask that uh, you keep your your uh, comments to three minutes. Uh, I'd also ask if it is a uh, in the affirmation of another participant, it carries the same weight uh, to say that you agree if you feel compelled to do so, if you are not going to raise other points. I understand everybody has the ability to put things in their own words, uh, but brevity is also effective. So with that, Roy, we promised you would have the first crack at this, Roy Helsel, uh, topic, questions of the city board members. Roy Helsel, 777 Middle Road, Portsmouth. Good evening, mayor and city councilors. Questions on the city board members. In reference to the city board members, should they not do their due diligence to find out all that they can about a project that they are to make a decision about that is going to come before their board? Like the effects it will have on the neighborhood, the height, the looks, if it infringes on the borderline or the property of the wet, of the property or of the wetlands, should they not know as much of the project as the city or the developers before they come before them to make a decision? Or does the city want the board members to know as little as possible on a project before they are to make a decision to vote on it? Shouldn't they know as much as the city or what the developer has presented? As for the rains or North Pond project that was 
referred to of Mr. Hewitt before he became on the board. He was like many others of us that were against it because it was within the 100 foot wetlands boundaries and the height of the project. But because the developer promised to build a walkway and put benches and bushes and in the foot, 50 foot infringement, then they turned it over to the city so that the city could do the upkeep of this and the city taxpayers' monies would be spent on it. What a deal for the city. They also questioned if this would cause flooding in the future, as in Hampton and Rye have now because of building on the wetlands. Isn't this a question the right thing for the project, for our city and for the taxpayers as a board member to shoot, to use. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. I'd ask that you hold your applause. Uh, Christopher White. Good evening. I am Chris White. I live at 28 Porter Street. Mayor McEachern, city councilors, thank you for the chance to speak to you tonight about this critical issue. I will leave the legal definitions of malfeasance to the attorneys here tonight. <clears throat> I wish to speak on a far broader issue that is at stake, that of public trust. Attorney Morell cites it often in her memorandum. I agree with her that it is central. Attorney Morell would have us believe that Mr. Hewitt's behavior violates the sense of public trust involved in carrying out his duties as a planning board member. I couldn't disagree more. It is Attorney Morell's behavior that violates the public trust. Her memorandum on this matter is classic projection in psychological terms. Attorney Morell, together with her City Hall colleagues, have done all they could to destroy the city's image around the town. Mr. Hewitt, on the other hand, repeatedly went beyond the limited scope of presentations and applications to dig into the facts to determine what was right and what was wrong in the proposals before the planning board. I would want my planning board members to use their expertise, their training, and their brains to determine what was accurate and true in the applications before them. I would not want some tight restrictions placed on the member's ability to inquire to investigate and to confirm the relevant facts of the application. They should be appointed because of these capabilities, not in spite of them. The city is at great risk, in my opinion, if we were to follow attorney morales and city management's restrictions of discouraging curiosity and critical thinking on the part of any of the city boards. The city should encourage such traits, not stifle them. The city should welcome diverse thinking and intellectual honesty, not squelch these important qualities. The danger the city creates with its actions against Mr. Hewitt is to destroy the rights of the minority, the rights of the abutters, and yes, the rights of the public. To protest against proposed developments when the proposal threatens the welfare of the city and its residents. How can the city with a straight face say it attempts to protect and defend public trust when in fact it is doing everything in its power to destroy public trust. City councilors, I urge you to vote against city management's proposed findings and rulings. Stand up for the public trust. Don't join with management to destroy it. Protect us from the city's actions and keep Mr. Hewitt on the planning board. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Next up, I ask you to hold the applause. Mr. Mayor, did you state we could stand if we agreed with a, with a person? I have asked folks to not applaud. Obviously, you have any First Amendment right to do whatever it is that you'd want. I agree with Chris White. <laughs> you will have, you're not listed on here, but uh, noted. Uh, Sue uh, Paladora. Again, on public trust. Sue Polidora, 245 Meadow Street. And um, 
certain occasions in my life, I have been in situations similar to this when all of a sudden everything and anything I did was spent and used against me. Let me tell you that, that I like trials, and this sounds like, this looks like a trial to me. I always learn things. Like I learned that the city doesn't seem to have an adequate follow-up after building permits are issued with conditions to ensure that those conditions uh, were met before the building is approved. I was here when the port walk was built. There were many conditions in there that were ignored. I also learned that the planning board can still allow a permit to subdivide a contaminated piece of property without regard to the consequences to the city and the residents. I also learned that many of the ordinances referring to quasi-judicial boards and meetings right now in the city are not aligned with the RSAs covering such matters. RSAs are, takes supremacy over this. Attorney Laughlin, you cited the New Hampshire Constitution where the proceedings began yesterday requiring to be an impartial judgment over the individual. After you read the statement about impartiality, this proceeding should have been summarily dismissed. As a lawyer, would, you, would it be allowed for jurors to be seated at a trial where many of them were already predisposed against the defendant? I think not. Many in the days, including the Mayor McEachern, had issues with Mr. Hewitt even before he was appointed to the planning board. Kudos to Councillor Denton for his honesty about not being able to vote without bias, thus recusing himself. Mr. Laughlin and Ms. Mayor, I have no expectation of impartiality in these proceedings. None. I have been here too long. I have seen all the political maneuvering. This should have been avoided. This kind of hearing is a fiasco, is divisive, is further going to divide us among those who think that we should do the right thing and an even bigger machinery that wants to tear people who had a different opinion down. Whoever gave you the advice to go with this kind of proceeding did not advise you well. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Next up, Esther Kennedy on the topic of public trust. Esther Kennedy, um, 41 Pickering Ave. And Mr. Laughlin, I uh, was in our school's um, law area to look up what you read tonight. So I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to, so it kind of took care of some of my conversation here tonight. I came here last week and asked you why. Why were you doing this? Was it Lafayette? Is it a builder, a developer? I asked you why. Why would you put a man with the qualities that we heard about Mr. Hewitt tonight through all this? Why would you put his family? We know it really doesn't have anything to do with the right to know. We know it really doesn't have anything to do with a quorum. We've heard that tonight. And if we really wanted to look at a quorum, on May 8th, I saw Councillor Cook, I saw Councillor Tabor, I saw Councillor Blaylock, I saw Councillor Denton. Oh, no, I didn't see Councillor Dalen. I saw Councillor Bagley and I saw Councillor Lombardi in a bar hanging out. May 17th, and I'm putting this on the record for you, sir, to uh, potentially have to take it forward because I think most of us know what the vote's going to be here tonight. Hopefully I'm pleasantly wrong. On May 17th, we talked with the city attorneys who had met that they had talked to all of you and that you admitted you were there. That is a quorum. There's nothing about emails. That was people together in the same place. And I have heard from others that there was another quorum, which you know. The other thing um, I've been hearing people talk about, for the record, is that 
board members cannot talk to city officials. And I'm actually okay with that as someone who has a board over me as a public school administrator. However, in the land use committee, and I went back to verify this last night, yes, at 1230, um, Mr. Monroe, Councilor Monroe, has regularly referred to, not only on the planning board, but in the land use boards, let me catch up with the um, planning committee team. You know, she meets with them for that land use. It's very clear. She is a sitting member on that planning board. And what is good for one is good for the other. So I ask you all, are you prejudiced in this case? Should you even take in this vote tonight? I ask you, Mayor, to stop this proceeding and call it a day. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Uh, next up is Paige Trace on the topic of self-explanatory. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Attorney Lachlan, attorneys present as unfortunate representatives of Mr. Hewitt. I am Paige Trace. I live at 27 Hancock Street. And the fact of the matter is Esther Kennedy is correct. There were a quorum of you that met several times at the State Street. I witnessed it and I received the same city attorney's response. So some of you should know Councillor Cook, Councillor Blaylock, Councillor Bagley, Councillor uh, Lombardi, um, what a quorum is. Now, Councillor Bagley at least had the decency to vote against this situation tonight. But the rest of you have been involved in quorums. You've also seated on that, been seated on that council for over two years. You're not junior councillors. You should know exactly what a quorum is. You should know what RSA 91A is. You should be schooled by this within an inch of your life by city staff. And yet, here is when you're asking questions. Why? So let's go back and look at um, Councilor, or Attorney Morell's documents, the big, huge dump of documents in the city council meeting a couple of weeks ago. Those were the ones that all tried and tried to prove Mr. Hewitt's guilt. You all voted then at that city council meeting to bring forward this particular situation tonight. I'll call it a trial because I see five city attorneys here, including Mr. Lachlan, and I see one representing Mr. Hewitt. So whatever else you may say, you all as a council with the exclusion of Mr. Bagley, Councillor Bagley, and Councillor Denton, voted on the guilt bringing this forward. That's all the information you had. You had no information in that packet to defend Mr. Hewitt. He didn't have time and he wasn't allowed. As a matter of fact, he didn't even know what he was being accused of specifically at that point. But you all voted as a council to bring it forward. So you already have bias. You voted on his guilt in the absence of his innocence. Shame on you all. It's a sad day for Portsmouth. And you all are better good people than that. Thank you. Thank you, Paige. Next up is Patricia Bagley. On no topic listed. What else would it be? Pat Bagley, 213 Pleasant Street. I don't have any formal notes, um, but I will say that I am disgusted. I am sad to witness this dehumanization of a volunteer citizen. I don't know how, what, how else you would characterize it. You've dehumanized Jim Hewitt 
for trying to seek answers and his wife. I, I really feel for him. He is a man of integrity. And he also, as you all know, we've talked about bias, bias, bias. Well, you're well aware that he did not support you in the last election. So you're already biased just sitting here. I just talk about bias. So, so um, the planning board is not allowed to ask questions of the city staff, which is a new rule that was frowned upon before, but it's a new rule as of January. Um, the planning staff gives the planning board information that they need for an application. But according to Attorney Sullivan, the staff gives information to the planning board that the staff feels is relevant. That's a little biased in my book. They think it's relevant and they give it to the planning board. The planning board is not allowed to ask anything of TAC, but TAC can advise the planning board, which is made up of city employees. I just think this is, this is such a railroaded job. I, I'm embarrassed, I am saddened, and I, I don't really feel like lecturing all of you because you give many hours to this city, but this is not our finest day. You really owe the Hewitts an apology, and, you, and this is our tax dollars. We're paying for all of this, the circus. Good night. Thank you, Pat. Thanks, up. Dick Bagley, public comment. A fact to follow your wife, Dick Bagley, 213 Pleasant Street. <laughs> um, I'd like to speak directly to the last two days because I think that's why we're here. This, in effect, is a trial. The recommendation is made to remove um, the applicant here, so to speak, uh, from his job. And you're the jury. And so I don't understand why this isn't a trial. We were sworn in, but you weren't. It seems a little strange. Um, I might agree with many of the comments made, but our job isn't really to reflect on what we think you do right or wrong. Our job is to think about what was said. We're intelligent people. We don't have to be lawyers to hear the evidence. So there's been two claims made. Jim committed, committed malfeasance and violated the right to know law. Well, we've been through this in Portsmouth before. In 2016, Jim Splain, as a city councilor, uh, violated the right to know law, according to some of you councilors, including Josh Denton, who's not up here right now. And subsequent to that, um, there was another case brought by Mark Brighton, who spoke tonight, and Arthur Clow, that uh, John Tabor broke the right to no law. That didn't pass mustard with the, the mayor and the city manager, Bob Sullivan. It did go to court, and there was a whole issue about um, legal standing that sort of got John Tabor off the hook. So I there was a third case which involved Esther Kennedy of the Beckstead Five. Guess what? Uh, Jim told you at the very beginning that he supported them. And so you can see that there's a, there's a pattern here. And the pattern is, for lack of a better term, politics. It's the real world in which we live. However, fortunately, in the past, we had a wonderful mayor also by the name of Blaylock. And when Jack was addressing the Jim Splain uh, situation, he made a comment before the city council meeting where Josh Denton brought it to a head. Let me just read you what he said. This is in the Portsmouth Herald. Carol, mayor Jack Blaylock continues to believe Assistant Mayor Jim Splain should remain on the city council despite releasing information from a closed door non-meeting two weeks ago. I'm not inclined to see him removed from office. 
Blaylock said Friday. What he did was wrong, but certainly doesn't reach the level of removal from city council. Mayor McEachern, you have a soul. You know what the right thing to do here, and you can lead and not follow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dick. <laughs> Next up, Greg Mahana as the interested citizen. Good evening. My name is Greg Mahana. I'm a Portsmouth resident, and I'm also the current vice chair of the Portsmouth Planning Board. Tonight, however, I am speaking as a simple concerned Portsmouth resident. I will discuss simple, publicly available information and not planning board business or applications. First, if you read the planning board rules and regulations, which are readily available on the city website, you will see that the term juror standard is only used once in that document. This is curious. Could it be that this is only this is because it is a guideline for impartiality only? It could be just that. I wonder. To add, planning board members are appointed from applications submitted and then approved by council. Hmm. Legal jurors are randomly drawn from voter records, then further selected by opposing attorneys. You will have more time. We got a new guy on the. Uh... <laughs> on the uh... rookies legal jurors are randomly drawn drawn from voter records then further selected by opposing attorneys jurors are then sequestered and isolated planning board members are neither sequestered or isolated following this point jurors receive the facts and testimony from attorneys and investigators that can be sent to jail for withholding evidence or material planning board members receive allegedly relevant facts from the applicant and from the city. Who goes to jail if all the facts aren't presented by city staff? In Portsmouth, it seems that the planning board member is the one that goes to jail. Attorneys Morrill and Sullivan want you to believe that the planning board member should rely solely on information and the recommendations oddly provided by the applicant and the city blindly, and then stand and take the fall. This is absurd. Personally obtained public information is not necessarily biased. Planning board members are selected and appointed based on unique talents. The current board contains a title attorney, a real estate professional, a real estate professional with a planning degree, a civil engineer, a DOT engineer, and former planning board members. If the juror standard was applied strictly here, members would have to be selected randomly off the street. That's not how it works. I like to make simple points. Mr. Hewitt is accused of sharing publicly available and important information with TAC. I want to know tonight, why didn't the planning department share this information with TAC? This seems to be a pattern in Portsmouth. What are the repercussions for the poor work of city staff? I want to know. This proceeding is a witch hunt followed by a proceeding which has no rules or guidelines. This is being made up as it goes and will not survive proper legal action. This is a travesty to the city of Portsmouth and its residents. The only outcome here will be additional lawsuits and the complete reluctance of its citizens to volunteer their time and experience for the good of the city that we love and reside in. I urge you to vote no tonight. This is a joke. Good night. Thank you, Mr. Mahana. Next up, Andrew Harvey on Hewitt's malfeasance. Hello. My name is Andrew Harvey. I live at 710 Middle Road. I'm the abutter that's been discussed uh, thus far in Exhibit 4. Um, on May 19, 2015, Jim Hewitt appeared before the Board of Adjustment to attempt to construct a barn three feet off the property line with 710 Middle Road. The Hewitts were rejected in their efforts. Years later, in the weeks leading up to my submission to the Planning Board, I came home from work one day to find Jim waiting for me on the back step of his house. He came onto my property to ask why I was having the property surveyed and what my plans were. I told him I was build, interested in building a DADU and was seeing what was allowed. Jim explained how he wanted to build the DADU as well and seemed to suggest that my chances would be better if we went together. While I cannot know what his words truly meant, I felt like he was telling me if I didn't help support him that he would oppose me. As Jim explained, building 
Him building a DADU would involve further expanding his access over my property and would cause me significant economic harm. I felt so intimidated by the interaction that I reached out to legal counsel. On their advice, I asked the Hewitts to keep any further communication about the development to a written form. Jim, as his counsel notes, subsequently assertively, assertively fought against my development. To read all of these emails now and find out that even after everything I went through, after I had to sit through the Hewitt's horrible personal attacks at the planning board, after I had to pay an attorney to go to superior court, Jim was still using his position behind the scenes to thwart me. It's chilling. Jim's counsel patted him on the back for recusing himself from my extension, lauded him for doing the right thing. He does not, however, acknowledge that Jim has been on the planning board while all of the new rules regarding ADUs were passed. A multitude of meetings have occurred where Jim has helped shape and mold the new rules. All of these new rules have, have directly affected the economic viability of my project. It has become a grossly non-conforming structure. Additionally, the new rules have increased his ability to get what he wants in the future. At not a single one of those meetings did Jim acknowledge his bias or recuse himself from voting. To me, this sounds like a textbook case of malfeasance. He appears to have used his art office to harm me and to benefit himself. I would strongly encourage the council to remove Jim Hewitt before he hurts anyone else. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Next up, Arthur Clow on This Isn't a Court. <clears throat> Arthur Clow, 431 Pleasant Street. The definition of a bully is somebody who is bigger or more empowered, who exercises unrighteous dominion and bullies a smaller, less empowered person. There's somebody here tonight that has been very quiet, and that's Beth Moreau. Because Beth Moreau might remember something from 2016. 2016, Beth Moreau was part of a group that was trying to push workforce housing and specifically spoke by email to members of the planning board, which she was on, city officials, et cetera, pushing to get the Echo Ave project passed. This was the subject of a, a newspaper article that you can certainly read, but I'm going to submit into the record some of this document. So she put together the document that they were sending, and it said, it, it is hoped that the attached can be used around committee members' ability to entice other members of the community to support Echo Ave. So 10 times worse than anything that Jim Hewitt is accused of doing. Beth has volunteered to speak with anybody who'd like to go over the aspects of what is attached if they have questions. Included, included on that email are Dexter Legg, herself, Nancy Pol Colbert Puff, Council, former Councillor Perkins, Rick Tainter, the infamous Steve Marchand, etc. According to this, each committee member will be asked to reach out to at least one other supporter of workforce housing to engage that supporter in the process and request that person business attend the hearing in support of Echo Ave. Beth's role was she'll contact the real estate community. According to the newspaper articles, Comstock confirmed Friday afternoon that Moreau crafted the attachment for her email about the important various issue, variance issues the city will need to consider. The document describes the requested variance in a section titled Breakdown of Each Criteria and How They Can Be Supported, which details arguments that can be made in support of the project. And her quote, she says, it's summarized, she does not believe it is inappropriate for her as vice chair of the planning board to advocate for a project. I don't see how that's inappropriate as it has nothing to do with the planning board. So what we're seeing is there's different rules depending on how you vote and who you are. There was no outrage for attorney Moreau's behavior. There was no public hearing like this. You guys are bullies and you're targeting him. You guys should have both stepped down. But Attorney Sullivan has gotten a lot of you guys to not have to deal with the unethical behavior that you exercise in your office. Thank you. Arthur. This is one big family. Thank you, you should be ashamed. 
You really should. Thank you. You're Mark. a bully. Next up, Peter Huda on subject of this special meeting process. Good evening, Peter Huda, 280 South Street. I have some questions that you need to think about. First, why was the agenda and the public announcement not aligned on the announcement of a non-public session <coughs> yesterday? Where was the announcement for the non-public session after it was initially on on Friday? Raises questions about the inconsistency in compliance with RSA 91. Yesterday, we witnessed a violation of transparency around RSA 91A and the standard of impartiality akin to a juror's duty when the City Council convened a non-public, non-noticed meeting in your faux court here. Just the perception that the City Council, who you are acting as a judge and jury here, strategized behind closed doors with only one side represented on, the, on an agenda item that they will be voting on is deeply troubling. This scenario, which would never occur in a real court for judges or juries, and contradicts the, pr the principle that Attorney Sullivan stressed so much yesterday. He stressed that the City Council and Planning Board must follow the standards and actions expected of a judge and jury in a real court proceedings. Could this have biased you all? Another troubling aspect from yesterday's proceedings was the, was the behavior displayed by City Councilor Denton while recusing himself, which unfortunately has become commonplace for Councilor Denton. The totally irrelevant political grandstanding and opinionated defamation of the prior council by Councillor Denton had no place here. But as usual, Councillor Denton couldn't help himself. Such actions not only distract from the professionalism and integrity expected in these meetings, but also fail to contribute constructively to any deliberations that you had. Next, I'd like to talk to you about the introduction of a different opinion by the city attorney than was originally put in the packet on Friday. Originally, according to the city attorney, the accusations against Mr. Hewitt were for a claim of malfeasance in office, as outlined in, in the publicly posted accusation on Friday. However, in the latest version, there has been a shift to an accusation of betrayal of public trust defined as a need to balance individuals' party rights with the broader community concerns. What seems to have been overlooked here is the fundamental reason why members of the City Council Planning Board and all others take an oath to help uphold the Constitution, interpret the relevant New Hampshire state statutes or RSAs, and municipal ordinances for each application presented to them. Public trust hinges on the adherence to the law and procedure rather than the influence of city staff and developers seeking outcome. Thank you. You have sure. to do the right thing here, Council. Just you going into a non public session to discuss this is an embarrassment to this city. Thank you, Petra. Next up is Jim Lee, Investigation and Engineers. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, Councilors, Jim Lee, uh, Sagamore Avenue, Portsmouth. I was appointed a member of the Zoning Board of Adjustment by Mayor Blaylock some years ago and served on that body until this past December, a couple of those months as the chair of that. I've heard some testimony about that we were, were discouraged from doing our own personal investigation of cases before us, and I'm here to tell you in the real world that it did not happen. In the hundreds of applications we considered, I made a personal site visit to each and every one of those before the hearing and did some independent investigation of my own on those things. So we independent investigation does take place whether you want to believe it or not. And after listening to these proceedings for the last couple of days, I've made a decision. I do not want to be sitting in the chair that Jim Hewitt is sitting in, and I don't want my wife to go through the hell that Liza has gone through. I have an application pending for a reappointment to the zoning board. 
I'd like to withdraw that application effective immediately. I do not want to serve this administration. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Next up, Jackie Cowie Pitts on confusion. I hope you'll understand my confusion, as one counselor put it. I'm too old, and I should probably step aside. Um, I am confused. I'm confused because I'm not sure what a public hearing is anymore or what a trial is. I know that at a trial, the grand jury or the people who indict do not sit on the jury. So I'm confused. And I've been sitting here for two days. I ask you about free speech. I'm on the recreation board. I, we have a project probably that's pending. I would want to do my own research. I understand that staff will do research. I understand that, you know, we'll get certain information from the board and we're only advisory. I want to do my own research. I have never even in the legislature voted on a bill that I didn't research thoroughly and try to understand to the best of my ability. I won't do that. I, I won't vote on something I don't know. And I don't feel that I've done my best. There's a lot I want to say. Maybe I'll send it in an email and it could be a meeting. Of course, I was there when they discussed meetings. I'm asking each and every one of you to look into your own souls, your own hearts. I don't know of one of you who has not misspoken or who has not been accused of misspeaking, rightly or wrongly, hurtfully or not hurtfully, who has not violated the city charter. I have had many discussions with Bob Sullivan about matters of 91A, not in public, not nasty, not, let's get this corrected, let's fix it. Look at yourselves and be honest with yourselves and find out if this action is not over the top. There's one thing in a trial, I'm not a lawyer, I don't even pretend to be, but there's one thing that nobody ever mentions, and it's called jury nullification. That you may look at all the facts, and you can decide what you want to do, but then you can also look to yourselves and say, maybe we don't want to do this. And if there's a lawyer here that wants to jump up and hit me over the head, go ahead. But that's the instruction from a judge. So please, this is ripping people apart. Don't do that. Please. Please. I don't know how to say it any better. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Kelly Pitts. Next up is Maureen McCallum. No topic listed. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Maureen McCallum. I live at 536 State Street in Portsmouth. And um, I just want to say a few things, and I'm going to read it because I'm not a public speaker and I get nervous. Okay, one, I am speaking from my heart, from the human side, most likely not legal. Because two weeks ago, for the very first time, I spoke with Mr. Hewitt and his wife, Liza, and their, it, their devastation was real. I saw it, I could feel it, and that night I could not sleep. I don't get involved too much with politics in Portsmouth um, because that's just not my forte, but I couldn't sleep that night because they expressed how they are feeling, what it's done to their family, and they couldn't understand everything. Well, I've been here listening 
to the, all this legal jargon for two, uh, for two nights now, and um, it seems so overwhelming. Um, but the devastation was real. Two, I want to applaud Attorney Sullivan tonight and the chair, Mr. Chalen. It was so nice to hear that they both spoke so highly of Mr. Hewitt. They both spoke of his knowledge and his understanding and his dedication. They spoke of his abilities and also um, his background. It was just so nice to hear some nice words. He, they also said he was a hard worker, that he did his homework, and he did more than what he was asked. That's a good person. That's someone that works hard. That's someone that cares about the city and is trying to do a good job. Maybe he made some mistakes. I guess this is apparent, but you know, sometimes you have to kind of dig deep. Three, I have not heard any, city, any other city councilor or any other city attorney say one kind word to Mr. Hewitt throughout these whole proceedings. Shame on you all. I just think they could have said, you know, Mr. Hewitt, you know, I, I, I do say that the mayor did say thank you for sitting here tonight. That was kind, but I didn't hear too much kindness. Number three, Mr. Hewitt is a private citizen who volunteers his time. He's not an attorney. Um, do you have to take a law course before applying to be on the, um, uh, the board of um, planning board? I wouldn't be able to do that. Who knows the difference between the word quorum and meeting? The poor guy, you had him there trying to answer those questions. He's not an attorney. He's a private citizen that's trying to do his job. Four, I've been on many boards throughout my career. Yes, the person that speaks out usually is blackballed. That's probably not a legal term or not politically correct. I don't know. But because of his knowledge, because that person on the board, because of his knowledge, exceeds other members of the board, sometimes it, it doesn't pay off. That person is just blackballed. It happened to me once. One more thing. Five, I want to applaud any citizen who brings um, for us information about contaminated water. And six, it takes courage of any board member to move away from the pack. It takes courage. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maureen. Next is Duncan McCallum. Good, good evening. My name is Duncan McCallum. I live at 536 State Street. Uh, what I have to say here tonight is basically going to be a continuation of what I said last week uh, during last Monday's City Council meeting. Uh, picking things up where I left off, uh, you all may recall that during that meeting I made the point uh, that uh, when we think of malfeasance, uh, we normally think of things like corruption, dishonesty, self-dealing, errors in judgment, honest mistakes, disagreements with others. Those are not malfeasance, and I ran through few examples of other things that are not malfeasance. Disagreeing with the opinion of the planning board director is not malfeasance. Disagreeing with the opinion of the planning board chairman is not malfeasance. Disagreeing with the opinion of the city manager is not uh, malfeasance. And even disagreeing with the opinion of the legal department itself is not malfeasance, especially when that opinion is wrong. On that subject, I see that in a written submissions, the city, uh, the city attorney accuses Mr. Hewitt of uh, having violated the rule of Winslow versus Town of, uh, town of Holderness. Uh, it just so happens that I am well familiar with that particular case. I've cited that case multiple times in the land use board appeals that I've taken over the years. Uh, and uh, all I can say is I guess the city attorney and I must have different copies of that opinion because my copy certainly doesn't say that the things that her copy apparently does. The city attorney is also absolutely wrong in saying that the, uh, Mr. Hewitt uh, acted improperly by going outside the record. She has correctly stated the juror standard for courtroom trials, jury trials in court. But in land use board proceedings, it's a little bit different. In land use board proceedings, you always have to go outside the record to some extent. I served on the Zoning Board of Adjustment for three years, and just like uh, my friend Mr. Lee, I made a point of always going out and personally viewing the property. The properties were the subjects of the petitions, because there is, if you want to understand the petition, if you want to understand the issues, if you want to understand what you're trying to do, 
Uh, there is no substitute for actually going out and viewing the property itself. Color pictures don't even come close to accomplishing that. They just don't capture the same character. Secondly, the New Hampshire Supreme Court has specifically said uh, that, you can, that land use board uh, members can consider their own familiarity with the property, its location, and its setting, uh, and consider their own personal knowledge of the surrounding conditions. Uh, as a land use board member, you're not supposed to be blind, deaf, and dumb, and you're not supposed to be oblivious to your surroundings and to the conditions in your community. For those of you in this room who are lawyers, uh, the case which says that is Vanna versus Town of Bedford, 111 New Hampshire, 105, 1971. Uh, as always, I always have a lot more that I'd like to say, but I would respect the three minute rule. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Duncan. Next up, Rick Beckstead on topic of support. Good evening, Rick Beckstead, 1395 Islington Street. Being mayor, it's difficult to find people to volunteer. The actions tonight before you, if you remove, will actually raise that to a completely different power level. Discouraging members of boards, of any kind of boards, and sharing information is deterred, I seem, these days. There isn't one of you, other than probably Kelly Barnaby, that knows a William Gladhill who served diligently under Mr. Blaylock's father, being one, who actually was a representative on the planning board, and he also served on the HDC. And he shared his information between both boards. And he went out above and beyond any other person to get information, never questioned. They valued his information, just like you would value Mr. Hewitt's information. It would never be discouraged. We no longer have that position because that was such a job that it's almost impossible to find somebody like that again. And I wish we could have that. But we should be encouraging the boards to talk to one another. Council Blayback, I talked to your father with that one. We had to make the appointment. He could not find a person, a soul, to ask that type of representation to be able to have function on two boards, two very, very big responsible boards. And he went above and beyond. God rest his soul. He would be discouraged tonight if we go and we vote to remove a board member the way that we have. Please, I urge you, do the right thing. Do not discourage. It is extremely difficult to get people to volunteer for these boards and their value and their time away from their families, just like you do. Sometimes they do a little bit more than what we do as counselors and as mayor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rick. Next up, uh, Elizabeth Bratter. Good evening, Elizabeth Bratter, property owner of 159 McDonough Street. I know Jim Hewitt personally as well as his wife. They lived next to us for about 10 years. He's a real rules guy and has a lot of integrity, and he can be a nuisance when you live next door to him because he notices everything. My husband is not a rules guy and kind of likes to hedge on everything. So that's my upfront thing. Anybody who knows my husband knows it's true. One of the questions that keeps coming up in regarding information provided by Mr. Hewitt is the question is, did he provide new information that was not in public record, not already discussed by the various bar boards, not readily available to the general public, and not in his knowledge base? What was the reason for providing said information? Are city board members allowed to ask questions of staff directly under the old rules? How can a staff member understand the difference between a board member or a private citizen asking a question? when it says a citizen's request on the top of your form. How, how are boards supposed to learn anything about what has happened at another board meeting if those minutes are not shared with the other boards? Should, any, should everyone who works for the city or is a volunteer use AI programs to change the tone of their emails to ensure the intention of their email is clear? 
The big question is, whose responsibility is it to add something to the public record because it was shared with board members? Is that the responsibility of the planning director, the board chairperson, the city attorney? Take, minute, take a few minutes to review all the names listed on all the various emails sent. Who were CC'd and who were directly contacted? Many people read the five emails in question. One was before he was sworn into the planning board and one was definitely as a private citizen. Mr. Harvey's comments made that very clear. That was a personal thing. And yet one of them, not one of these emails, was added to the public record during two years. Why not? Mr. Hewitt was never asked to recuse himself due to these emails. Why not? Take the time to really remember that it is state law that decides what the city rules can be. Sometimes even city attorneys forget the city rules and state laws. They know the requirement of the right to know law. Emails were sent to boards. Those must be added to the public record. Does their knowledge of the right to know law and the lack of action constitute malfeasance on their part? Per the Cornell Law School definition, malfeasance is an intentional conduct that is wrongful or unlawful, especially by officials and public employees. Thank you. Please. Uh, that concludes the public comment. We now move. Yep. Certainly. Um, did you stand and and swear? Uh, okay. Um, Kelly, uh, we'll have to swear him in. Sure. When we're done, we'll start the timer. Just need to find my sheet here. I'm going to, this is, will be the last public uh, speaker. Is that anybody else have a change of heart? Yes. Because we're going to, okay, because this is the last swearing in of the evening. Okay. Okay. Do you state your name? Justin Richardson. Solemnly swear that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth upon the pains and penalties of perjury. I do. Okay. And your name again, Justin? Justin Richardson. Richardson, thank you. I live at 586 uh, Woodbury Avenue. Um, I've been there since uh, 2016. Uh, before that, I worked in Portsmouth, but I lived in Newington. Uh, I was on the uh, planning board there for many years, chair of the Conservation Commission for seven years, been on the Sewer Commission, uh, various other boards, uh, zoning board. Um, I'm also a municipal lawyer. I've represented about seven or eight towns on planning issues, helped them rewrite their zoning ordinances, deal with controversial projects. Um, I, I got to meet uh, Mr. Hewitt and come to know him a little bit. I don't know him that well. Uh, but I was so impressed with him. I worked on the sound barriers issue many of you are familiar with. Um, Woodbury Avenue traffic issues, I reached out to him about a DOT question at one point. Um, my my um, impression of him was what a nice person he is and how lucky we are to have someone like that who cares about the city. And, and that's what you have to do. I mean, you, we can all disagree on issues, but if you're working for the planning board or as a volunteer, you're somebody that cares. Um, so what does malfeasance mean? And I, I was really shocked because of what, I, what little I knew to find out that he'd been accused of that. Um, and I thought about it. It's not a term that's defined, but I think the prior speaker got it right and I actually looked on Google's AI and it says it is typically an intentional wrongdoing. The legislature knows how to say illegal, violates the law, knows how to say negligence, errors, all of those things. But they said malfeasance because I think what they wanted was when we get to this extreme point, there should be somebody who acted in a way that was wrong 
and knew that they were doing the wrong thing, but did it anyways. I, I just, you've heard the evidence. I, I, I haven't heard all of it. I, I came to this hearing late. But from what little I know, I can't even begin to believe that, that Mr. Hewitt could be guilty of that. Um, he, he cares about Portsmouth and wants it to be the best place. And, and we've heard a lot of accusations made here. I believe the same thing about you folks. I, I know maybe six of you, not, not, not all of you, but from what I've heard and what I understand and what I've seen in these meetings, I believe you have the ability and I'm confident that you'll, you'll reach the same conclusion that I did, that Mr. Hewitt didn't intentionally do anything wrong. Thank you very much for your, for your time and hearing my comments. Thank you, Justin. Okay, now I'm going to dig through the pile of papers for the, we are now on to the final statements uh, by council. Can we have a break before Oh, we yeah, start? we should probably, it's 10, almost 10 o'clock. All right, we're going to take a 10 minute recess. <coughs>
Uh, welcome back. Uh, we have uh, final statements by council before uh, city council deliberations and the vote in finding the fact and action. Um, uh, Attorney Eggleton, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Again, my name is Jeremy Eggleton. I represent Jim Hewitt. I'm from the law firm of Orr in Reno. Uh, you've heard the evidence in the matter and I definitely now want to talk about the law. <clears throat> but before I do, I just want to apologize uh, for my part if at times I've sounded a little indignant or frustrated or aggressive in the way I've argued this case. I feel this one very personally. I uh, grew up in this state. I think New Hampshire is a pretty awesome place to live. I lived for a time on Marcy Street in Portsmouth. It was an awesome city to live in. And so I feel it personally, what the city government is doing to Jim Hewitt right now. I don't think it's right. I do not think that what is happening tonight is right. It is not justice. And so if that bleeds into my, my emotion about this issue, then I apologize. Mr. Hewitt expressed to me uh, just before the hearing started last night how uh, this process has <clears throat> awakened him to the notion that uh, criminal defendants are awfully lonely when they're out there. Um, and having the eye of the government focused on you and alleging that you've committed malfeasance or a crime is a very lonely place to be and it's given him substantial sympathy for those who are accused of crimes, even justly. So I don't know if you've had a chance to read the memo that I asked the city to circulate on Friday. I hope you have. Um, but I would ask you to consider the following points of law and fact that are further elaborated in it. First, <clears throat> New Hampshire law allows the removal of a land use board member for three things, and only three things, inefficiency, neglect of duty, and malfeasance. That language is not unique in, to New Hampshire. It's common in federal law and in other states, and it's, it's not new language, it's old language. This is language that comes out of the 19th century, and it's the language that legislatures all over our system use to protect certain offices from political pressure. Unlike the Secretary of State for the United States, for example, who serves at the pleasure of the President and can be removed by the President at any time for any reason, a land use board member in New Hampshire can only be removed for those three things. And according to our Supreme Court, those three things are the only things that can justify removal. Further, when a legislature articulates three specific reasons like that, it means those things and only those things. It does not mean a broader for cause power to remove is implied by those three items. And you have heard and obviously you can read that the juror standard is not listed anywhere amongst those reasons, the so-called juror Standard is found nowhere in the removal statute, 673.13. The juror standard is found in the disqualification statute, RSA 673.14. So a member who has a personal interest in an issue or who cannot be indifferent to the outcome of the matter may be subject to disqualification. But even then it's up to the member at the end of the day no one can compel an appointed land use board member to disqualify himself. Just as I could not compel you, those of you whom I asked to disqualify yourselves, because I believe that you have conflicts of interest in this case, you made that determination yourselves and said I can fairly and impartially judge this issue. So, Councillor Cook, with respect to your question on the question of the motion for rehearing and how 
uh, Jim Hewitt had expressed a feeling about that particular project in advance. No disqualification was required if Mr. Hewitt believed that he was capable of indifferently hearing the evidence in that case and rendering a decision, just as the mayor does in this case. So disqualification is not required. And if disqualification needed to occur, the remedy for a disgruntled applicant who's unsatisfied with a particular vote by a particular board is that the dissatisfied applicant can ask a court to void the decision that was made by the person on the board if he proves that that member violated the juror standard. Uh, it's happened in the Winslow case that was cited by Attorney Duncan, <clears throat> but it's pretty rare. And uh, the applicant has to bring it to the attention of the court and the applicant who was unsatisfied with the result can invoke the disqualification standard. It is not something that can be relied on in the context of removal. They are separate creatures and you must understand that. In this case, none of that ever happened here. No one ever asked Mr. Hewitt to recuse himself. No one voted for him to recuse himself. No decisions had to be overturned because of his failure to recuse himself. And I will definitely talk about this in a minute. Nothing that he did justified recusal. And if nothing Mr. Hewitt did required his disqualification, then it is a, a gross misapplication of the law to think that those incidents require removal. Removal as I said, is only permissible for those three things, inefficiency, neglect of duty, and malfeasance. The city isn't even trying to argue the first two. As you saw, Mr. Hewitt was almost always in attendance, and he paid very close attention to the issues before him. So the only thing left for the city to hang its hat on is malfeasance. <clears throat> I shouldn't need to say this at this point, but here it is sending emails asking for documents and information to be part of the public record for a planning board decision is not malfeasance. Seeking documents you know to exist, which you think should be considered by the planning board, is not malfeasance. Reminding an applicant of something you told them in a public session so that their application stands a better chance of approval is not malfeasance communicating before you are a member of the planning board is not malfeasance. Seeking a developer's compliance as a private citizen affected by a decision made before you were a member of the planning board is not malfeasance. What is malfeasance? Taking a bribe, stealing money, trading your vote for private gain. That's malfeasance. Nothing here rises to that level and goodness, I hope you can see that now. The city's attorneys are trying to expand malfeasance to fit any conduct that they think is unusual or unorthodox or not in compliance with the city's regulations. And it's interesting to me, as I listen to the testimony, especially from Mr. Sullivan, um, who referred to common sense, common sense standard that you're supposed to abide by. Uh, he said there's no law governing these issues. It's common sense. And so the city has created a system that is candidly more stringent than what New Hampshire law requires. The planning department and the legal department forms recommendations about how to vote on issues, tells the planning board what evidence it can and cannot consider. And the effect is that the board operates as a rubber stamp in many cases. Uh, and in service to that framework, the juror standard and the right to know act are employed to keep information, uh, keep, to, to keep counselors in line in essence. Now, I, you know, it's, it's not my specific area of law, but I, I think the city has the power to create rules like that most likely and impose those rules on its system, its planning system, it can probably do that. But what you can't do as a city is then use a violation of those contrived standards 
the standards that the city prefers to have, which are more stringent than New Hampshire law, as a basis for removal of a member. Because all that is doing is subverting the intention of the legislature with respect to 673.13. The legislature very clearly does not want cities and towns erecting policy architecture that simply allows them to remove a member because they don't like what the member did with respect to how they operate. It just isn't required. So I submit to you that if there is malfeasance in evidence in this case, it is all on the side of a city government that is hell-bent on destroying the reputation of a distinguished professional engineer who has served this town with dedication. There are two Supreme Court, Court cases that I believe bear on this issue and control it. I've referred to them in my papers. The first is Williams versus Dover, 130 New Hampshire, 527. That is the only case in which a planning board member was ever, uh, the removal of a planning board member ever made it to the New Hampshire Supreme Court. And in that case, uh, to give you a little bit of background, the member, and this was in Dover, was an employee. He was on the planning board. He was also an employee of the Elliott Rose Company. And as an employee of the Elliott Rose Company, without identifying himself as a board member, just as Mr. Hewitt did not identify himself as a board member, but with the knowledge on the part of all the city officials that he was a planning board member, of course. Mr. Williams reached out to the city officials regarding construction of a driveway on behalf of the Elliott Rose Company and was informed that a number of permits were required and the company proceeded to build that driveway without the permits. And then again, Mr. Williams, on behalf of the company, contacted city officials about a proposed greenhouse that the city said needed a construction permit which would require a site plan review. And much as uh, Mr. Hewitt did in this case, Mr. Williams argued that the greenhouse project didn't require site review before a permit would issue. Like Mr. Hewitt, he never referred to his position on the planning board in his communications with any city staffer, but as you uh, city's attorneys have argued, everyone knows Everyone knew that Mr. Williams was a planning board member, so wasn't he leveraging his authority, his reputation, his, his office in favor of, in that case, his employer? What the city council removed him for malfeasance and the superior court upheld that decision and the Supreme Court said no. Merely being on the planning board does not mean that you are acting in that capacity when you speak with city planning staff. That's what the Supreme Court said about those issues. The actual quote is that nothing in the record before us supports the conclusion that Williams' actions were directly related or connected to his performance of his duties as a planning board member. Absent such a relationship, we conclude that it was error to order his removal from office for malfeasance. We do not imply that the legislature could not restrict the conduct of a public officer in Williams' position by barring him from dealings with other officers, even in a private capacity, in which his official position might be thought to provide an advantage. We only hold that such dealings do not fall within the scope of malfeasance under the existing statute. The statute hasn't changed. It's the same case, in fact, Mr. Hewitt's case is even less egregious than what Mr. Williams did. Because Mr. Williams was trying to get something to happen that hadn't already been ordered by the planning board, which is the case here. So two of the alleged incidents advanced by City Hall fall within the Williams ruling. The first one is incident number one. The, the December email in 2021, Mr. Hewitt communicated to people in the community before he was a board member about a project on Raines Avenue. He called it a monster. And guess what? He's an American citizen and can express that opinion. It was before he was a planning board member. That is evidence that you can simply ignore. 
it is not malfeasance under the Williams case. Incident four, Mr. Hewitt advocated for himself in relation to 710 Middle Road, a project he, that had been decided in the summer of 2021, long before he was a member. He wanted accountability as an abutter. He wanted to make sure the owner adhered to the conditions imposed by the planning board. That was his right. In doing so, his actions were not directly related to or connected with his performance as a planning board member. In the electronic communications supplied by the city, Mr. Hewitt declared himself a citizen on page one. At no point did he assert his status as a board member, just as Mr. Williams did not. Mr. Williams agreed he had no power as an individual. Mr. Sullivan, excuse me, agreed that he had no power as an individual board member to order the planning staff to do anything. And when the matter did come up in front of the planning board, my client recused himself from that vote, not because of the letters he received from the city or any overstepping that was alleged, but because he had an interest in the case. And under the juror standard, he had to recuse himself in good faith. So that case disposes of incident four. And I might add that there was no testimony in this case from Mr. Hayes. Um, if Mr. Hayes had thought that Mr. Hewitt was acting as a planning board member or he was getting pressure, then I assume he would have been on the stand testifying to that. But he was not here. And in fact, if you look at the electronic communications, and there were only electronic communications between Mr. Hayes and Mr. Hewitt, um, Mr. Hayes treats him like a citizen. And he says, go get yourself an account. Everybody knew that he was acting on his own behalf and not as a planning board member. The, hypo the violation that is suggested there is entirely hypothetical. Third, the next case that we need to consider is Andrews versus Kearsarge Lighting Project. I've got that one here too. It was decided by our Supreme Court on August 31st, 2023. It's what we call in the law a slip opinion which means that there are no new facts or legal permutations that required the Supreme Court to issue a published opinion. It's not, for that reason, precedential. However, the reason we pay attention to this kind of case is that the Supreme Court has determined that all of the stuff, the facts, the, the law, the issues that came up in that case, it's all decided by existing New Hampshire law. We don't need any new or novel considerations here. And so we do pay attention to that case in this case because that case was a disqualification case. And in that case, what happened was city of Conway, North Conway, uh, had created an ordinance that was essentially uh, anti Airbnb ordinance. And the lighting district cited certain owners for violating the ordinance that required uh, residential owners. In other words, if you were going to be renting your house out, you had to live there. The ZBA upheld the decision and cited, uh, and the cited owners appealed, arguing that one of the ZBA members had made inappropriate communications outside the record with people opposed to the cited owners, including the member's own son. The record showed that the member had lively discussions via email with other board members and third parties about the appeal including about, quote, challenges facing the Kearsarge lighting precinct. The Supreme Court rejected the argument that these communications created any impression of bias because the member did not expressly communicate his position on any issue then pending before the board. That's what happened here. In none of Mr. Hewitt's communications, is there any actual assertion by him of what he thinks about the case? They are simply Statements into the void, really. As you all clarified in direct questioning, nobody ever responded to any of these emails. The Supreme Court's decision on that is consistent with reams of law on this issue around the country. The bias that is alleged must be actual. It must show prejudgment, not just a predilection towards a certain point of view. It can't be a hypothetical potential bias or an abstraction, something that might happen. 
we can't say, well, the Co Conservation Commission could have been biased by that. It must be actual, actionable to disqualify, let alone to remove. And based on that standard, none of Mr. Hewitt's alleged outside the record communications showed any bias. Nowhere in these communications does Mr. Hewitt say how he intends to vote on any issue. No one ever responds. Mr. Hewitt is being smeared with a charge of malfeasance based on an abstraction, and that's not the law. In Andrews, the parties also argued that the board members relying on information outside the record to inform his decision contributed to the fundamental unfairness of the ZBA's decision. The Supreme Court rejected that argument too. And this is where the city's planning rules really do diverge from New Hampshire law. The Supreme Court cited longstanding case law, including the case cited by Mr. Duncan and uh, Briggs versus the town of Sandwich and a, the Dietz case, which said that ZBA members may base their conclusions on their own knowledge experience and observations as well as their common sense. Furthermore, the people bothered by that decision have to show that the outside information amounted to fundamental unfairness so as to constitute reversible error. So we go back again to the remedy. If someone thinks that a counselor or a land use board member was biased in advance of the decision, then they can bring that to court and try and prove that. But they have to show that there was fundamental unfairness. Nothing about his communications create fundamental unfairness for the applicant. It is absurd to suggest otherwise. Not only did no one who received those communications react, but they were either requests for information or information presented to demonstrate why Mr. Hewitt himself had such a reaction at a particular board meeting or in the case of the TAC communications in December, they were communications that had already been made to the applicant in July. So you have to ask yourself, gosh, these folks, Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Chelman, are talking about this very rigid, abstract rule. Your mandate is much broader than that. Was it fundamentally unfair? Did it have a fundamentally unfair impact on the result? If it had, any one of those applicants could have appealed the matter. Nobody did. Nobody asked him to recuse himself. Nobody voted to recuse him. None of this happened. We are here based on an abstraction. That is not the law. And the Andrews case, as a reminder, was a disqualification case, not a removal case. Taking those standards into account Nothing Mr. Hewitt did would give rise to disqualification, let alone removal. Now, regarding exhibit number two, Mr. Hewitt made a request of the planning department for environmental studies relating to the application, in his view, and suggested to the Conservation Commission that in the future, they always try to keep in mind Portsmouth's self-identified standard as an eco-community. He didn't state any position on a pending application. He didn't demand a different result from the Conservation Commission on the pending case. He did not indicate how he was going to rule. He was aware of the environmental information about this project based on his own knowledge, experience, and observations, and his common sense about projects built in or near wetland areas. And ultimately, the matter never even came to the planning board because the developer had a matter removed for reasons unrelated to Jim Hewitt even according to counsel. And gut check, does asking for good environmental study information meet your personal sense of what constitutes malfeasance? Is it fundamentally unfair for a planning board member to seek environmental information about a project in a wetland area, setting aside whether the planning board has jurisdiction over it or whether the City's attorney's office have said, hey, look, that's off limits for this thing. Is it fundamentally unfair? That's your mandate to consider. And I hope, I hope the answer is of course not. Regarding exhibit number three, 
The application was for additional parking in the West End Yard site that had been approved in 2019. Mr. Hewitt asked the Planning Department if video links to the Planning Board's prior hearings, all public record, could be added to the packet for the upcoming hearing. He did exactly what they said he should do. The Planning Department said that was unnecessary because it was all public record and he was free to circulate those links to other members. They gave him permission. So he did. So he was aware that these properties had been before the board before, his own knowledge and experience, and his common sense, and suggested that listening to those meetings would be helpful for board members in considering the application. And he was told by planning staff, that'd be okay. Under Andrews, this is all valid conduct and a valid basis upon which to consider a decision. He did nothing wrong in Exhibit 3, number 3. And as to the question of it's just a word on RSA 91A2. We've talked about what the law is. Mr. Laughlin, I think, was accurate. Um, the form that was circulated, Council for the City obviously has a different view of this, but what this does is it gives you a little flow chart for how to consider electronic communications and whether they constitute a meeting. You can stop right here at are there sequential communications involving in the aggregate a quorum of the body not one of his communications in which he copied the planning board and all its members or the conservation committee or the TAC or anyone else produced a response. And the answer is no, no violation. No violation of RSA 91A. So even if he had violated 91A, the remedy would be to undo the decision if indeed the violation affected the decision, but he didn't. The application regarding Exhibit 3, we just talked about. So we've addressed Incidents 1, Incidents 2, Incidents 3, and Incident 4, and now we turn to 5 and 6. Regarding Incident 5, not only did Mr. Hewitt know about the cont contamination on the Banfield Road site from his own prior knowledge and experience, the entire matter was extensively discussed during the planning board meeting. If you read the minutes at Exhibit I, you will see that the board debated and discussed contamination, the allocation of responsibility for cleanup, the planning department's own recommendation that responsibility for site cleanup be a condition of approval for the site plan. The board recognized that the contamination was a serious threat to human health that the board's jurisdiction reached to remedial measures, including capping. And after the vote was over, Mr. Hewitt, being the sole vote against the issue because he felt the application was incomplete without conditions relating to responsibility for cleanup, he circulated some publicly available information about the site, the contamination, and the lawsuit, and explained to his fellow board members, this is why I was so upset last week. No decision was pending. He had already voted. He'd already voted against it. The facts at issue were both part of his prior knowledge and heavily discussed during the hearing. The disqualification statute expressly addresses this situation. <clears throat> there is an exemption under the disqualification statute for facts that one learns in the context of one's duties. It says, reasons for disqualification do not include exemption from service as a juror or knowledge of the facts involved gained in the performance of the member's official duties. All of those facts came from his official duties. These are not disqualifying facts and knowledge. It's black letter law. The city's reaction, Mr. Chelman's reaction, Attorney Morrill's reaction, it's over the top. It's not the city attorney's office that determines what information is relevant to the board's consideration. It is the board. That's democracy. We put people in office to make these determinations. The city attorney can make recommendations, sure. But the board at the end of the day decides what's relevant. The board might be wrong. If the board relies on evidence that a developer later uh, proves was not germane to the issue or should not have been considered, maybe that decision gets reversed. But it's the board's decision. Citizen appointees, not professional staff, 
have to make those determinations with all due respect to the hard work that the city's uh, staff members do on a daily basis here. This remains a government of the people. To call Mr. Hewitt's efforts to bring attention to the serious issue of environmental contamination that he believed the board had the power and authority and the duty to address is not malfeasance. <laughs> Lastly, exhibit number six. In July 2023, the applicant at 581 Lafayette Road met with the planning board for a preliminary consultation. It's a great function of the statute. It allows a developer to come before the planning board and put their chips on the table and say, here's what we'd like to do. What should we be thinking about? So that they can spend their time and money productively, right? And not waste time concocting a plan that they don't know whether the planning board has, you know, is going to uh, approve or not. And so at that meeting, Mr. Hewitt and Mr. Chelman both identified a serious issue. Their improvements were on somebody else's land. And they informed the developer that they would have to get that taken care of, whether that's an easement, some agreement, acquiring the land, whatever the case might be, restructuring the parking lot, they have to address that before they can even get their application to the planning board. It's not a question of bias. It's a question of is the application facially complete for consideration. They said, you've got to fix that. I also said, uh, we would like more information about the parking situation. We want a study. They said that in July. So around comes that same application now being considered by the TAC. And because it's public information, Mr. Hewitt reviewed the application that was going before TAC and he said, they haven't fixed any of this stuff. Can you remind them that they need to deal with this stuff before they get to the planning board? That's what he asked for. Seems pretty reasonable to me. He wasn't asking them to impose new conditions or concocting conditions out of his brain that he wanted them to comply with. He was saying, please bring to the meeting the following things so that we can talk about it. That is absolutely 100% in spirit of what the pre-consultation process is intended to accomplish. Because why would the applicant show up with the same plan if the planning board can't even accept it as it is? Totally reasonable communication about facts and knowledge acquired in the context of his job. So to summarize, none of these incidents are malfeasance under New Hampshire law. The city is pushing into uncharted territory in its effort to smear Mr. Hewitt with malfeasance. That's false. I will add it's defamatory. It's defamatory per se. What's going on in this room is not justice. It's, it's not how local government should operate. I request respectfully that you deny the motion to remove Mr. Hewitt from the planning board and you permit him to complete his term as a planning board member. Anything short of that result will require us to seek judicial review, attorney's fees and costs and damages. And I am very convinced based on the law as I've articulated tonight that we're in the right on this one. I hope we don't have to go there. I implore you as many articulate citizens have already done to do the right thing here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Attorney Elton. Attorney Morrill. So clearly, we strongly disagree on the law for this council to apply to the facts of this matter. Attorney Eggleton has presented an impassioned argument of a tortured interpretation of the removal statute, the juror standard, and the right to know law. In my memorandum and in um, communications with the council in this matter, I have referenced a definition of malfeasance that is cited by the New Hampshire Supreme Court. 
That is the ultimate authority of law in the state. They cited it in the Williams versus Dover case. They said malfeasance, they went to a specific definitions for malfeasance. It doesn't require some awful thing. It doesn't require a crime. It doesn't require bribery, theft, or some other felony. The definition used by the New Hampshire Supreme Court is a broad umbrella of categories, of types of acts that could constitute malfeasance. It's not an exclusive list. It's not intended to be an exclusive list. Many acts could constitute acts which ought not to be done. That is the language from the New Hampshire Supreme Court. Many acts could constitute wrongful conduct that affects, interrupts, or interferes with the performance of official duties. Many acts could constitute misuse of office. So the use of malfeasance in that statute, the New Hampshire Supreme Court has looked at in one of their cases and provided a definition for legal scholars, for litigants coming forward, that it is includes those three phrases, acts which ought not to be done, wrongful conduct that affects, interrupts, or interferes with the performance of official duties, or misuse of office. This is a general broad umbrella. It doesn't say it can't be a violation of the juror standard. A violation of the juror standard is an act which ought not to be done. A violation of the quasi-judicial standard of being fair and impartial member of a land use board is an act which ought not to be done. And it certainly is wrongful conduct that affects, interrupts, or interferes with the performance of official duties. So that's our first major disagreement in this proceeding. What is malfeasance? And you can find definitions of malfeasance in multiple dictionaries, multiple references. But what's important in New Hampshire is what the New Hampshire Supreme Court tells us. That's the only definition that matters. The intent of this proceeding is the protection of the process guaranteed to property owners in our city. And property owners who have a right to know the rules and regulations controlling the use of their property. The purpose of this proceeding is to ensure that owners are provided with due process because the court, the New Hampshire Supreme Court, has said repeatedly that is the purpose behind the quasi-judicial standard. In your role as a planning board member, as any land use board member, you have an obligation to conduct yourself consistent with a judge or a jury, to be fair and impartial to the people that come before you. That provides due process, excuse me, to the applicants who are appearing in front of you. And those applicants are people citizens, property owners in this city. This proceeding is about the proper roles of our land use board members and the roles of our public officials and how we honor the right to know law and the constitutional protections that the public's business will be conducted in public, and yes, to ensure the public trust in that process. 
The next major disagreement we have is Attorney Eggleton's reading of the applicable provision of the right to know law in 91A, defining a meeting and looking at the guidelines of what should be done, what ought not to be done under the right to know law. As pointed out by a number of you in this conversation, in this deliberations that we've had here, there is a provision that talks about contemporaneous communications, even if they're electronically done through electronic communications, such as email, that are for the purpose of discussing or deciding a matter of business that might come before the board. That or means something. Again, going to the authority here, the New Hampshire Supreme Court, and any time they interpret statutory language, they look at the plain meaning of every word. They will not add words that don't exist. They do not take words out that are there, and they use the plain meaning. Or means or. <clears throat> So we can argue a lot about potentially whether a meeting takes place when there's a sequential communication in emails amongst the quorum of a public body. What I can tell you is in looking at the New Hampshire Municipal Association guidelines, the New Hampshire Attorney General's memorandum on right to know, and in a court case from the Superior Court decided in 2015, they all say email use should be carefully limited to avoid any inadvertent meeting. Simultaneous emails sent to a quorum of a public body discussing or proposing action or announcing how one will vote would constitute an improper meeting. The court in this case in Carroll County, Porter versus Sandwich, that was decided in 2015, a superior court order, talked about one way communication from one board member does constitute a meeting, even though no discussion among the board members took place. It was enough to create an illegal meeting. The court went on to say the key to contemporaneous communication is the ability to communicate contemporaneously. Very helpful to use the same word in a definition. But not whether it actually occurred, but the ability to communicate contemporaneously. Now perhaps there are a number of disputes we could have in regards to whether one email not responded to constitutes a meeting. That misses the point entirely. The concern has been, and what you heard from Attorney Sullivan, what you heard from Mr. Chelman, is the concern is the danger, what the New Hampshire Attorney General's memo says, you should avoid any inadvertent meeting that could be created when you send out an email to a forum of other members. Inadvertently, people can reply all. And all of a sudden, you have a contemporaneous discussion. You should avoid this. Mr. Hewitt was told over and over and over again to avoid this, to stop doing this, because created the risk of a meeting, an illegal meeting, because it creates the impression that you may have bias, you may have prejudged a matter, because it creates that risk that you no longer appear indifferent 
violating the juror standard, violating the quasi-judicial standard that you are sworn to uphold as a member of the Land Use Board. The law requires you to make findings of fact, the proposed findings and rulings of law that Mr. Hewitt committed malfeasance in office. The question is if this council finds that the acts set forth in the charge in the charging document that you have as a course of conduct, so several events that occurred over the course of his two years in office, if that illustrates that Mr. Hewitt committed any acts which ought not to be done, any acts which substantially affect his ability to perform his official duties, going back to the definition of malfeasance. If he committed any wrongful conduct that affects, interrupts, or interferes with the performance of official duties, if he misused his office, then he in fact has committed malfeasance. The charging document takes these actions and all of the corrective actions that were attempted. This is not one instance, all of our boards and commissions are made up of volunteers. Everybody understands that. Everybody gives everybody a second chance, a third chance, fourth chance. But when you get to the fifth and the sixth chance, there has to be some acknowledgement that what you're doing is wrong and you're not going to do it again. And that you're not going to get from Mr. Chelman. Didn't get it tonight. What are you risking? You're risking other litigation. You're risking litigation from your land use applicants. You're risking litigation from people who want to make a claim that there's some violation of the right to know law going on that isn't being corrected, that's known and isn't being corrected. So let's just go through these exhibits real quick for you because you're going to have to go through that charging document. I'm aware of how late it is and I'm sorry, but we have different views of what all of these actions mean. And I think it's only fair to hear the city's view on this as well as you heard from Mr. Hewitt. It's true that in exhibit one, we're talking about um, communication uh, for Mr. Hewitt that occurred prior to him being put on the board. So should you not consider that? No, you should still need to consider that. And why should you still consider this as part of the course of conduct? It's because there are very strong views set out in that email that he sent to a number of appellants in a litigation, in a land use litigation of which he had been one, very strong views, not just about that particular project, but any project around the North Mill Pond, any project within the wetlands buffer. And that is what Attorney Sullivan said, well, well you're not even, you're not on the board yet, but you're gonna have projects around the North Mill Pond. You're gonna have projects that involve these issues that you've stated very strong opinions about. You need to be careful because you're now taking a role on the planning board that puts you in a completely different set of requirements, legal standards, and obligations. In an exhibit two, we have a whole set of emails back and forth with Mr. Hewitt requesting from staff information regarding a New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services DES permit status for several projects proposed for what the North Mill Ponds 
that would be coming before the planning board, 31 Rains and 203 Maplewood Avenue. In fact, this request for the rehearing on these projects was on the agenda as we talked tonight for the January 27th, 2022 planning board meeting, the first meeting that Mr. Hewitt sat on as planning board member and he voted to have the rehearing. And prior to that meeting, he asked for copies of any written correspondence, emails, telephone conversations, summary memos, meeting minutes regarding the Department of Environmental Services application. Not an application in front of the planning department, but an application from a third party. He also asked for environmental site characterization studies and he asked for water quality sampling studies. He sent this on February 13th, the Sunday, and asked for a reply by the 16th at noon. That's because he wanted them for the 17th, which was a planning board meeting in which they were scheduled to have a rehearing on that project. But the rehearing didn't occur for legal reasons due to litigation. But clearly the action was taken as an action of a planning board member to gather evidence for a planning board meeting outside of his common knowledge, outside of the record. He was known by the planning staff as a planning board member, of course he is. You know, this is not that big a city that the City staff doesn't know who's on their land use boards and commissions. He was advised, again, this is, you shouldn't be doing this because it looks like maybe you're biased. It looks like maybe you have prejudged things. Not only did he send an email to staff, but he sent an email to the, in, the quorum of the Conservation Commission. And how did we know that? Because the person on the Conservation Commission had a moment saying, oh my God, this is an email to a quorum. This shouldn't happen. I'm referring it back to the planning department and to legal. So the planning department, Peter Britz and the city attorney at the time, Robert Sullivan advised Mr. Hewitt he shouldn't be directing an advisory board on how to act because you appear not to be indifferent. You appear that you are prejudging things and you're trying to achieve an outcome behind the scenes without the light of day, without a public hearing. It shouldn't happen. And then in exhibit three, we have the request to the planning director asking for documents for the approval of the West End Yards project from both 2019 and 2021 to be added to the planning board packet. Now, maybe there was a confusion about what Ms. Zent meant when she said we will provide that to the board, but she clearly clarified that later in her emails to Mr. Hewitt saying I meant I would the planning department will submit this. This is a conversation as we heard from Mr. Chelman that was occurred many times in the planning board. If you need documents submitted to the planning department or if you want information from the planning department, go through the chair. Why is that? To avoid any of these misimpressions, to avoid any potential problems, to avoid the appearance of not being indifferent. And then in exhibit four, have Mr. Hewitt taking substantial action um, with a member of our planning staff suggesting, and I know this has been debated factually, so it's for you to resolve the facts, but Mr. Chelman says in the emails to Mr. Hayes, Mr. Hewitt was suggesting that the compliance officer impose additional requirements on this project 
that were not in the planning board decision. And it's a project that he had previously been a litigant in and had a substantial interest in. He says, I didn't identify myself as a planning board member, so it's not an official action. Really? <laughs> He's directing a member of the planning staff in a city very small where the planning staff knows exactly who's on the planning board. He should know, he really should know that he should have said if he was acting outside of the bounds of planning board, he should have identified his actions as such and made it clear, I'm not, I'm not coming here to put any pressure on you or using my position in my office from the planning board. I'm here as a citizen, this is a personal matter. I'm looking for this information. <clears throat> he didn't do that. And then again in October and November of 2003, Exhibit 5, the Banfield Road. Mr. Hewitt well knows that after the decision of a planning board, there is an appeal process. Not only an appeal process to the Superior Court, but there's also the potential for a rehearing. That was like the first thing he did as a member of the planning board was he voted to have a rehearing. He knows that that can happen within that 30 day period. And despite that, he sent an email to a quorum of the planning board, every planning board member, and he added documents not in the record, he added documents from the federal court on an order on a motion to dismiss. That wasn't brought in front of the planning board at their meeting when they made their decision. He brought in a link to a number of news articles. Those weren't in the record of the planning board during their decision. And what is the risk here? That if there is a rehearing or there is an appeal, the planning board members, all of them now, are potentially tainted by that outside information that was provided to them outside of the public record. Did the whole board respond? No, because the board has been told and they understand that they're not supposed to engage in these types of contemporaneous communications with a quorum of a board outside of a public meeting. But the problem is Mr. Hewitt's not taking the advice to avoid this because it could create a meeting, an illegal meeting. And he's not taking the advice that this appears that you have bias about a particular project <clears throat> and you're not being fair. And so finally, In December and January, he sent two emails to the entire Site Plan Technical Advisory Committee, TAC is what we call it, um, who works as an advisory committee to the planning board, it's made up of experts in their field who are members of our staff, who know where to look, who know how to read a plan, who know what concerns are, who've already heard concerns from the board in their meeting about parking and about encroachments, an encroachment on state property potentially. There was no need for this communication. This communication again was to an advisory board, to the entire board, all of the staff. It was done outside of the public record where the appellant, the applicant rather, um, had no ability to know this. Well, would it be a public record if a public record was request? Yeah, yes. But that's missing the mark again. The mark is that this is creating the impression that he's not indifferent. This is creating an impression that he's trying to accomplish something outside the normal channels, outside of his role as a planning board member. 
He says, I wasn't directing them to do anything, I was just suggesting. Just suggesting that they review. And then a week later, wait, you didn't hear me. I'm gonna suggest again that you review. I've addressed the issues um, at length in my memorandum of law about the Andrews case. So I'm not gonna get into that um, in any detail at this point, other than you can see that's again an area of law where we have a very strong disagreement. I believe that we have presented sufficient evidence for you to make a finding that Mr. Hewitt has acted with bias, that he has not been indifferent, that he has not upheld his obligation as a planning board member to sit in a quasi-judicial capacity and to apply the juror standard. There are proposed findings of fact that would include all of the information that's in the charge as a course of conduct and all the evidence that you've heard and all the documents that have been presented to you for you to make a finding and make motion. So we're asking that you find that he has in fact committed malfeasance and that you also remove him from the planning board. Thank you. Thank you, City Attorney Morrill. <coughs> Now on to the uh, City Council deliberations. Um, are there questions that we have either for Peter or for each other? Uh, Councilor, or Councilor Bagley. Uh, sorry, no questions or comment. Also, I'll wait to ask the questions. Uh, Councilor Bagley. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I just have a couple questions for Attorney Lachlan. Um, am I correct? <coughs> that the purpose of the removal statute is not to punish land use members, but to protect and preserve the integrity of planning board decisions and the applicants who appear before it? I think that's fair to say. Um, am I also correct to define malfeasance as doing of an act which ought not to be done? That's what the court indicated in the Williams case. All right, thank you. Are there limits to what not ought to be done, Attorney Laughlin? Is there a bar based on the case law? I, it's probably a, on a, going to be on a case-by-case -case basis. I mean, there's, there's some standard. I don't know how you would describe it, uh, but um, I think it's going to require a looking at the facts in each case. Can a... Um, a lack of indifference rise uh, to not uh, being not or falling under what ought not to be done? I think it can. And uh, for this reason, um, we don't, for planning board members, we don't require <coughs> any particular educational background or um, uh, testing or anything like that, we re require one thing, and that they be indifferent. And um, um, if, and I think the indifferent is, rather than use the word bias, I, I think the word indifferent is the, is a better test, and that's what the statute talks about. That the, and they, when they talk about the juror questions, can the person be indifferent? And that's what uh, I think um, has to be looked at, and um, if the person, uh, does not appear to be indifferent, then that I think that can rise to to malfeasance. There's um, um, and in terms of how that's judged, I think when when uh, attorney when uh, Josh Denton was here, we were talking about his situation um, that. Um, whether an appearance of impropriety exists is determined under an objective standards, standard. Uh, would a reasonable person, not the judge himself, question the impartiality of the court? The test for the appearance of impartiality is an objective one. That is, whether an objective disinterested observer, fully informed of the facts, 
would entertain significant doubt that justice would be done in the case. And that's why I suspect that the, the um, city attorney's office repeatedly raised the concerns about the appearance of impropriety. Can um, research done outside of the, the public record, and I guess I have some questions on why things are not in the public record, but um, can that research alone uh, create a appearance of a lack of indifference? Can you be dispassionate and indifferent and look at a matter outside of the public record? I think you can, uh, I, I think that a, a planning board member uh, can look at, go by the property, look at the property, look at hips, and, um, and bring some information in. We, you know, at some point it stops looking like um, using your own judgment and raises questions about impropriety. I think that's the, what the concern of the staff was then. And we've had some disagreement from the council on, on whether or not a, what constitutes a meeting. You've opined um, that the mere act of sending uh, a meeting or sending an email does, does not constitute a meeting. Would you agree that it represents the danger of a potential meeting? I think that's what the, as it was indicated, especially by um, Chairman uh, of the Planning Board, that it, it, it creates the danger. And that's why the, the, the request by staff always is don't do it. Uh, not, not that in and of itself it creates a violation, but it creates a danger of, um, of responses that um, create the appearance of not indifference. Is that danger not the, the, the holding of a meeting uh, because it, it looks like um, intelligent legal folks look at that differently whether or not a email creates a meeting but in your opinion does the potential danger of a meeting rise to the level of malfeasance is that under the statute or the under the um, Supreme Court definition of having ought not what doing no, that's going to kill me each time I try to say it doing what you not ought to do I guess um, does that, um, because it could do something that is illegal if other people act, is that, in your opinion, rise to the level of <coughs> malfeasance? I think it's really going to be a question of um, maybe one incident, two incidences. At some point, I think the, there's a, a real question as to whether that does I think a champ, that, that can become malfeasance at some point. Are there any other questions of the city attorney or the, and just to clarify, uh, I know it was brought up um, in public comment, uh, two things that I should note here. Um, the council uh, didn't rise for uh, swearing a, um, uh, the oath uh, sitting here, we have taken an oath of office, and we are bound by uh, those rules. Uh, second, there was a, a comment that we met in non-public with the city attorney. In this case, city attorney is sitting not on the dais, the dais, uh, and we have attorney Lachlan, uh, who is capable and is representing us as a city council, as separate from the city legal department. Wanted to make that. No. This something else that probably should be clarified uh, that the non public session was advertised on several places where the agenda usually is advertised and on the on the one that was po posted in some place I mean Susan can probably clarify that, but it was posted several times and on one location it was not posted one and uh, the afternoon of the meeting, um, 
uh, Attorney Morrow contacted um, Attorney Eggleton and myself and said, there's been a mistake. Um, it should have been on everything in an overabundance of caution. Um, uh, there will not be a um, non-public, there will not be a public session before the non-public, and that was, it was a, um, a, a mix-up on the, on the way the, po the notice got posted, not on the nefarious scheme to hide anything. Can I just fill that out just a little bit more? Is that the, um, the right to know law says specifically it's not a meeting, a public meeting that needs to be noticed if it's consultation with counsel as long as no action occurs and that was the purpose of your meeting prior to the beginning of the hearing yesterday. Thank you. Attorney Morrow. Any other questions? Any other statements? Statement? Uh, no, actually, I've got one question and then a statement. Okay. Uh, Attorney Lachlan, um, so some of the discussion tonight was about the juror standard and, and it was brought up uh, several times that uh, yeah, most recently by just you yourself that you can go and visit the property. Is it that is a kind of a special exception that was created with planning board or land use boards in particular that going to visit a property that is under discussion is, is kind of like a carve out from that juror standard? The, um, there's a case that where the court said well, the statute says that planning board members can go and, and uh, examine the property and bring their own knowledge, and it talks about actually visiting the property. Okay, thank you. And I guess um, I'll I'll make some comments first. This is a this has been a not a great uh, two days, in my opinion, for the city. I do want to point out, um, you know, the three things that we're looking at: inefficiency, neglect of duty, or malfeasance in office. Uh, the first two, um, Mr. Hewitt could never be accused of, in my opinion. Um, he does a tremendous job of fact-finding, uh, sending emails full of, uh, I, I get him on PTS, I get him as a council member, and he's a tremendous researcher. I think it speaks highly to his character. The number of people that uh, not only spoke here tonight, but have been in the audience uh, for two very long nights. Um, so I think, um, I wish that we weren't here tonight for this reason, uh, but we are. Uh, the cat's kind of out of the barn in that respect, but I do think it's worth highlighting, um, you know, the the tremendous amount of support that Mr. Hewer, Hewitt has garnered. I don't know that there are many individuals in the city that would have a room full uh, 11, 15 at night for the second night in a row. So I, I think that bears mentioning. Um, however, uh, we have been here. We have looked at a number of things. We have very conflicting opinions from the two attorneys. Um, the malfeasance to me uh, is a much scarier word before it was defined as ought not to be done. Um, there does seem to be, uh, the city has a number of rules and regulations that we have to follow as a council or we have to follow on a land use board um, when we step up to serve or to volunteer. And whether or not those rules are correct or, or legal or allowed in New Hampshire, I can't speak intelligently to because I'm not an attorney. So I have to rely on the city attorneys. I have to rely on the city staff. And uh, based on how they execute themselves everywhere else, I have to assume that those are all true and correct. And if those are all true and correct, um, the series of events that have happened, um, the repeated warnings of what you ought not to do, um, and at least in the beginning, it seemed uh, that Mr. Hewitt acknowledged that maybe, um, you know, there was a coming up to speed period, and, and that's challenging for anyone. Um, uh, as he attested earlier, he wasn't looking to be on the planning board. He was, he was kind of appointed, I, not short notice maybe isn't the right word, but, you know, I, I think he started his, his November not thinking he was going to be on a planning board, and, and then early January, uh, or late January, I guess he was. So... You know, trying to come up to speed is a very challenging thing. Um, but we also had uh, Mr. Harvey speak tonight, and, and he was the only one uh, that kind of represented the, the people, the applicants, the abutters out there who don't normally get to speak. Uh, you're given a, a great responsibility when you're on a land use board because you're telling people what they can and cannot do with their property. And many of the people that come before those boards uh, 
they're intimidated. They don't like to speak in public. It's, it's a daunting task. Um, they have to have absolute confidence that they're getting a fair shake and an unbiased or indifferent um, board before them. And I think there were some actions that we, we learned about over these last two days that would shake some of that confidence um, in at least some of our citizens. And uh, that is what I'm struggling with here right now. And I guess I would like to hear from the rest of the council. Council Moreau. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd like to start by trying to clear up. I think there was some misconception about the changes to the planning, bo planning board rules and regulations. Um, we did not make the change about all questions so the planning board members can't ask staff questions. We made a change because staff can sometimes be very overwhelmed with cases and um, applications that they're and parties that they're working with. And if we have five people from a board all emailing people with what might be the same question, we thought it was very, you know, streamlined to be able to have those questions all go to the chair and then the chair can synthesize those and make sure they get to the right person to be more efficient. And that was what the attempt in the changing of the rules and I think that was misconstrued um, as this process has gone on. I agree with my fellow Councillor Bagley on just about everything that he said just now this evening. I have struggled with all of this. I can actually, re I'm an attorney. I understand both sides. I could argue both sides because that's what, you know, we're taught to do is to argue. And to argue our case, I agree that the totality of the actions are extremely, um, extremely inappropriate. I don't believe that they should have occurred. Do they raise to the level of malfeasance? I'm not totally convinced of that as well. Um, I do believe the act should not have happened. I don't believe there was any sort of malicious intent. And that's where, having served on the board for the last two years, I don't believe that Mr. Hewitt had any malicious intent. I do believe his intent was good. It was just misapplied. And the attempts to try to correct that have clearly not been successful. Mm -hmm. um, I would hope, I don't know, I still don't know how I'm going to vote. I honestly don't. I'm still struggling with what direction to go in. How do we protect the applicants that come before planning boards? And how do we protect the land use members that are on our boards as well. And I think that's a really thin line that we have to carefully consider. I'll look forward to hearing from others. I think, oh, I was just gonna pose one question that I, and go to the assistant mayor. One question that has come up for me uh, repeatedly in uh, these, um, these two days um, and I do appreciate uh, certainly Mr. Hewitt being here, uh, Attorney Eggleston, the city attorney, everyone here. Um, I would echo the, uh, the spirit of Councillor Bagley in saying that uh, being a part of your government, it means showing up to your government uh, and so appreciate uh, the folks that have been here. The thing that that I'm not quite sure of is given the the whole reason that we're we're here is the belief that the that decisions or meetings or potential meetings are occurring mm -hmm. outside of the public record, and I think that we can universally state that if there was such actions occurring, that if people were deciding things out of the public view, especially, especially when it comes to your property rights, that that would be universally admonished. That things that occur when you go before a land use board, your expectation is to face that land use board and have every uh, every opportunity to challenge the questions that might occur. And so when Mr. Chelman was saying these are all fine things to have, 
in the public record. I, I wish they, they were in the public record. I looked at the documents and I looked at the email. And the, the email that, that, that was different in the two exhibits was the exhibit on, uh, for Mr. Eggleston, uh, where Mr. Hewitt uh, responded back to, um, I think it was City Attorney Sullivan at the time, asking how do I move these to the public record? I don't know if our system right now uh, can incorporate uh, the level of uh, inquiry uh, for a public body, um, but I, it's difficult when a question of legal staff goes unanswered from a standpoint of how do I raise concerns that have occurred in the public, how do I get them into the public record, and it's a nuanced discussion, sure, but I don't have any record of that discussion occurring um, at all. I understand now that we have uh, new rules with the planning board uh, that were maybe difficult to uh, figure out how to put in. Um, but part of that goes, uh, that process goes to the chair of the planning board to be a part of the public record. When asked, Mr. Hewitt answered in the affirmative that his actions going forward would follow uh, those rules. And so it's difficult for me when we're deciding the crux of the issue, the absolute most important thing, we've said it on, everybody said it, but the public trust, and we're talking about Mr. Hewitt, somebody that has dedicated a large portion of his life uh, to public service and also just working in the state, uh, municipal service, but we're talking about the public trust that things that are decided, that we're not having this conversation back there in non-public, we're deciding and figuring this out on our own in public is a vitally important part of a representative democracy, a democracy that is, you know, a government that's run by the people. That is a hard thing to, to equate or for me to wrap my head around that it, that it rises uh, to malfeasance, even if the, the danger occurs that a public or a meeting could be. Um, you know, I haven't seen any record presented that Mr. Hewitt responded to any other email that potentially uh, created a quorum. I, I understand that the potential risk exists, but I also trust that the training has been done enough at least in this case that the examples that we found, there is not a single instance of a reply to all of the emails that, that Mr. Hewitt uh, has stated. So as part of my deliberations, I'm trying to figure out, you know, the most important part of this. Um, the, the second point, I think the thing that rose, um, you know, high on the record, and this is probably because I'm on the council, um, the, 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 I think it's uh, exhibit four uh, around um, the, um, the, the requesting of information. Um, that is hard, I think, and maybe I take a personal exception to this because, you know, um, I think people will treat you differently because of the position regardless of what you do uh, around that. Um, you know, not to make light of a of serious situation, but on a lighter note, I felt that I was robbed uh, recently at a uh, Valentine's Day dance. I thought, you know, potentially my position as mayor kept me out of the running for a finalist uh, in that. And my daughter could not understand that at all. She danced her butt off, and yet we didn't make, you know, five finalists out there. There was only like eight people dancing. Um, so I carry a special weight with the abuse of any power, uh, uh, any office that could occur. Uh, and I don't know, you know, it was, as I sat there listening to maybe if he had mentioned that he was a planning board member and he wants to be treated as a citizen, that could have been construed the opposite way. Um, it could have been like, hey, just so you know, I'm a planning board member, but I want to be viewed as a citizen in this case. So it's difficult for me to say that it would have been, 
an abuse of power um, to, to mention that. And I feel like the time to raise that um, would have been by the planning director to directly reach out and say, for any, you know, we will ask you to do this separately. But it seemed like there was engagement on that topic. Now, there was um, public uh, comment to the role of uh, what Mr. Hewitt has sat on and, and, and created um, different ADU law. He has, I believe, and I could be mistaken, the right from a re regulatory standpoint to make any decisions that he wants based on ADU law that would be viewed as prejudice or not prejudice to a neighbor. It's difficult to uh, cut that out. What he has to do is then uh, apply any regulation in an, impartial, uh, in an impartial manner if it reaches the planning board. And I don't believe um, that he had an opinion um, on regulation uh, rises to that uh, level of um, uh, malfeasance either specifically because he was acting in a regulatory manner uh, in that way. Um, I should have passed the gavel, realizing that now. Um, but I will. Uh, waiting for your question. Yeah, there was not. Yeah, I guess it was more. It was uh, uh, comments that I've been thinking about so far. Thank Sister you, Sister Mayor. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, well, I I believe that compelling arguments were made on both sides. Um, I find it difficult that we are here uh, for the second night, but that we're here at this hearing. Um, I was not at the January 16th meeting, but I would have been the third vote to not move this forward to hearing. Uh, I believe that these are issues. I believe that um, Mr. Hewitt did place somewhat outside the unofficial rules. Uh, as you know, quoted by former Mayor Beckstead, um, he wouldn't play by the rules. I believe to some degree, um, unfortunately, Mr. Hewitt, um, you were somewhat set up to fail in, in that aspect. Um, I'm happy to see that the planning board has adopted new rules that have outlined things very clearly. Uh, I believe that if there were, I believe that the concerns are valid, um, but I believe that there are other ways that this could have been handled. Um, it is not uncommon in the state of New Hampshire for a land use board member to be censured by um, that board. Uh, it is not uncommon um, in the state for there to be a ethics violation um, brought forward against a land use member. Um, I think there could have been other ways to handle this. Um, again, I do believe that there were multiple circumstances that were played outside of the what I will deem blurry lines of of the rules that have long been followed, um, rules that, as were noted tonight, that most board members follow. Um, my line of questioning is uh, of asking you, Mr. Hewitt, of why um, do you think that nobody replied to your emails? For me, it's a clear observation that it's a well-documented rule that you <clears throat> don't do what you did. Does that rise to removal? I'm not sure. But again, I think that this process should, this should have been handled in a different process, in a different forum, um, in, an, in a, yeah, I think that's where my opinion stands at the moment. Thank you, Assistant Mayor. Uh, going down the line, Councilor Tabor and Councilor Cook. Thanks, Your Honor. Um, <clears throat> we've heard a lot of testimony and uh, read a lot of documents. I think my findings are, first of all, I don't think that Jim Hewitt uh, was doing anything he thought was wrong. I think he was doing what he thought was in the best interest of the city, um, and he was doing it zealously in many cases, doing a lot of homework. Um, I th first off, I don't think you can have one kind of meeting, even if it's not a meeting, 
where you're informing members of your own board behind the scenes, uh, and then you can have another kind of meeting where the board debates in open session in public. Uh, I think it's particularly wrong, in my opinion, to be sending emails to quorums of bodies with information that's not in the public record but actually uh, goes beyond <clears throat> what a consensus of the planning board had been. For example, <clears throat> the request to uh, have a parking data study uh, for the Lafayette Road property, the planning board had already asked and agreed as a stipulation that the applicant was going to bring back comparables from his other projects. The issue had been dealt with. And then there's this um, behind the scenes email to the TAC um, saying, I want more. And I don't think that's fair to the applicant. <clears throat> I think that's uh, something that should not happen uh, going forward. Um, the uh, right to know questions, um, it's burned into all of our foreheads as counselors that you don't email to a quorum. Um, the city attorney says there is Supreme Court law that a one-way email does to a quorum does constitute a meeting, but that's disputed. It's not even, it's disputed by Peter Lachlan, who wrote the municipal law textbooks. Councillor Tabor, can I just say it was a superior court? Superior court, yeah. sorry. Ruling. Thank you for the correction. Which leaves it open for debate until it gets to the Supreme Court. Thank you for the correction. We agree that it's on debate. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think those are wrong actions uh, that cannot continue. However, um, when it comes to removal, um, I think this is an honest citizen doing what he believes is right, um, making, uh, doing it in ways that should not happen and are not, and do cause problems for our applicants, but I don't think there's a strong enough case for removal, quite honestly. Um, and I'm not sure removal is the right thing. One of the wisdoms in our government is that not one person is trusted with adjudicating land use decisions. Nine people are trusted with it. And Mr. Hewitt's one of nine. And he's put many pieces of information before the planning board, and the planning board has often disagreed with them. And that's why you have nine people. Um, the Conservation Commission received his um, admonishment to uh, get all the environmental uh, permits um, and the status of those cases. Um, they didn't uh, follow his instructions. So our government's uh, uses collective decisions um, to be the most fair. And I don't think that Mr. Hewitt even, uh, I think he can continue on because of the strength of nine people making a decision. Um, and uh, I also placed a lot of weight on Chairman Shellman's testimony because I think of him as Switzerland uh, between the city and, um, and the planning board. <clears throat> and <clears throat> he also has great experience. Um, my concern with his testimony and my f finding of fact is that in many cases, uh, Mr. Hewitt, uh, let's take the Hayes incident, um, was um, going beyond what the planning board 
had asked of that applicant or required of that applicant. <clears throat> Adding additional requirements and then going directly to a city staffer um, to get that, um, he's totally conflicted in doing that because of his dispute and litigation. Um, but, and, and should not have done that, but it's the imposing of additional conditions beyond what the planning board had ruled. That to me is um, saying, I'm gonna, my opinion is more important than the decision we all made together. It's almost subverting the decision of the planning board. And that can't happen. Um, that should not happen. And I think that's wrong action. Um, but as I say, to me there's a lot of dispute over the law over removal. Attorney Eggleston's cited some cases. Um, I think our use of collective decision making um, allows us to have somebody like Jim Hewitt who often runs against the mainstream and often brings out facts that make the final decision a better decision. Um, so I would not support removal. Thank you, Councilor Tabor. Councilor Cook. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I wanted to start my comments by um, first addressing Mr. Hewitt um, and uh, the respect I have for you, Mr. Hewitt, and your knowledge, uh, what you bring to the table as a planning board uh, member is impressive. Um, you're extremely smart. You do a lot of research and you share that research widely um, with members of many bodies in the city, including the city council. And so uh, I would, I want to be clear that we're not here tonight to judge um, your qualifications for the position you're in or um, how smart and capable you are, because you are very smart and extremely capable. Um, but I also think it's important tonight to remember that we're also not here to judge how our um, processes generally work, how our planning board, the TAC, the Conservation Commission, how the staff handles information. Um, there, there have been a lot of criticisms, and, and we awful, often hear those, um, about how things are done um, on our boards, but those decisions and how those things and processes work are really not decisions for planning board members or zoning board members or anyone who's sitting on a quasi-judicial board because their actions there when they're sitting are really to act in a quasi-judicial nature, um, to act under the jury standard. Um, they're not there to judge whether or not they think the staff are providing with them with the information they want or providing other boards with the information that they think those other boards need. Um, that's really a political question, not a quasi-judicial question. And um, land use board members are not granted the political authority to make those determinations about how the city handles um, itself. Um, However, they are asked to make decisions that are quasi-judicial in nature um, under that juror standard. And I think that it was really clear tonight what that standard is um, from not only 673.14, 500-812, the Winslow versus Holdenness case. It's really clear what the quasi-judicial standard is and what the juror standard is. It's also clear in Williams what malfeasance is. And um, these are, you know, I just quoted two su um, Supreme Court cases in New Hampshire. So that's the final arbiter of the law. Um, I think it's also important, though, to also to note that the city, when we're hearing from the city attorney, um, we have heard repeatedly that this wasn't one violation. It wasn't two violations. It was repeated violations. Um, I thought it was in incredibly important that before Mr. Hewitt even sat on the planning board in December of 2021 that our legal counsel at the time, our city attorney, um, Sullivan, um, 
let him know very clearly what the juror standard is and what the quasi-judicial standard is in an email um, pointing out that he had already um, created possible um, bias or um, we want to say uh, lack of indifference by email he sent in December related to a case um, that ultimately did come back to the planning board and came back to the planning board when he was sitting on the planning board. So he already received the warning about that case and the comments that he made not showing that he was not impartial and not indifferent, and yet he still chose to not recuse himself, even though he knew the standard. And I've already said I think that Mr. Hewitt is a very smart person. I don't think that he didn't understand what he was told. And he, vo he still voted on that case to rehear the case, and he was the deciding vote. It was a 5-4 vote. So I think it's important to note here, the city didn't sanction him for that. The city didn't even comment on that. They'd already commented on that knowledge. But the city instead, over the course of the next several years, reminded him again and again of that standard and the standard he should follow. Um, reminded him in, on, in February, reminded him again um, on that standard um, in October 2023, December 27, 2023, January 4th. So there was clearly a pattern here. And the real question that I have before me is, did he understand the rules? Did he understand the juror standard? Did he understand the requirements of a quasi-judicial board member? And I think the answer to that is yes. Mr. Hewitt is a very smart person. I think he's highly capable of understanding what those rules are for our planning board members in making decisions. Is that enough to rise to the standard of removal is another question. Well, I think it, it does meet the standard of what ought not to be done in Williams which is malfeasance. Um, but note that in New Hampshire, removal occurs very, very rarely. And this is the first time the council, um, in this case, is hearing um, about um, this situation uh, as a whole. Um, and so, we have never, we haven't issued a formal warning or a censure um, to Mr. Hewitt, and I think that's important to note as well. Um, so I have questions around whether or not um, there is an alternative, um, if there's an alternative to provide a formal final warning or censure and a guarantee that none of these actions would occur again. Um, so I, I have those questions around this case. Um, but I also have questions about fairness and due process, um, whether or not the applicants at 1 Reigns, 31 Reigns, 203 Maplewood, 581 Lafayette Road, and 375 Banfield Road were given true due process in their hearings because information was introduced outside of the public hearing process. And if those applicants did not receive that information and did not know that a communication was occurring outside of those meetings, how were they to respond to that information that was before the Conservation Commission or the TAC or even the Planning Board? Um, and so that's ultimately the problem we are dealing with is we have to be f fair on our land use boards and we have to be able to provide due process to everyone involved and act completely impartially in those processes. And when we introduce outside information, we're not doing so. So um, uh, I do believe that uh, Mr. Hewitt understood um, the violations that um, he was committing. I do not believe that there was ill intent by any means. I think he cares passionately about this community. Um, and I do question whether or not there is another way forward. Uh, Councillor uh, Lombardi and then Councillor Bowie. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, and 
I'm not someone that is very long-winded, um, so you'll be happy about that. <laughs> but um, I, uh, I think that one of the most <coughs> important things in front of us um, is that of uh, being clear and open and um, to the public. I think that what the whole idea of right to know, of judicial standards, um, have to do with the ability of the public to see the process of their government. Um, and um, I agree that if anything goes on behind uh, any decisions are made behind closed doors, that's a real problem. If um, I think that Mr. Hewitt, I agree with uh, Councillor Cook that I think Mr. Hewitt, you're a very intelligent man. I, I see that. Um, I see, I, I believe me, I have not read all of your emails. Um, I, I admit to that because you send a lot. Um, but what I have read, um, they're, you're very articulate, you're um, well studied, and, um, and I appreciate that. Uh, I think the problem is, is one of process, and well, there's a couple of problems. One of process that um, you want to get information to other people, and uh, but somehow you're missing a process that has been established by the city. I, I'm not sure that is that the intent of that is malicious. Um, I, um, but I also have to appreciate the gentleman who came. Um, and spoke here about um, his feelings about uh, the incident on his border. Uh, I for, I'm sorry, I forget your name, but um, and uh, I think that the efforts of the city attorney and Mr. Chelman to give you corrective advice um, has been very generous. Uh, at the same token, I, I feel like a, a mal, just well, a removal process is maybe going too far. Um, and it, I guess what I would l love to do is to find a way to have uh, you, Mr. Hewitt, and our attorneys and your chairman really figure out a way to um, have a corrective relationship in terms of uh, avoiding these issues that have come up. Um, I don't know what that is, and I don't know if it's possible, and I don't know if you are open to that, um, because from what I've heard in these hearings is that um, people have told you and encouraged you and asked you to behave in a different way. and. Uh, what I've heard is that you've ignored that. Um, and as Councillor Cook said, um, you're intelligent enough to understand the impact of that. Uh, I'm still up in the air where I'm going with the vote. Uh, but um, I just, I wish there were another way. And I guess I will be convinced one way or another 
um, that that's possible, or that um, maybe, or that removal is the only answer. Thank Council you. Council thank you, Council Member Thank you, Honor. Um, that was longer than you. And I do want to thank Mr. Hewitt. I consider you a neighbor. I consider you a fellow member of Portsmouth City of Portsmouth, um, fellow public servant, um, an engaged member of our community. Um, and I truly appreciate that. And I have never once questioned um, whether or not you're an intelligent man or not. I, I know that you are. Um, but like I said before, uh, it's very unfortunate that we've come to this situation tonight. Um, I, I do believe it's possible to make a mistake. Um, I believe it's possible to make a couple of mistakes. Um, but then once uh, those mistakes have been addressed and that behavior continues, continues and continues and it continues to be addressed and there is no change in behavior, I consider that wrongful conduct. Um, and under the facts that we've been given here last night and tonight, um, I believe that malfeasance has been committed. That being said, I, I, st I want to protect or preserve the integrity of our land use boards. Um, I do think removal is a bit much. I don't, I don't, I hope we can find a solution that is, is not removal. Um, but I do want to ask the uh, attorney Lachlan if we found malfeasance has occurred and then there is no removal of the member of the planning board, would that put the city in, in, sort, in sort of a uh, bad position? as far as its land use boards. I, I, I presume that, um, well, we all know that the only limit, to, limit on what is alleged in any lawsuit is the imagination of the lawyer bringing it. And um, <laughs> so it's going to be, um, you know, I, it's going to be out there saying, well, there's evidence of um, not proper conduct. Um, and um, I guess if it occurs again uh, on some future thing, that some future application, um, that type of that, that allegation would be made. But and it, whether it was true in that case um, would have to be determined. I, I there's a uh, well, you've you've laid out the pattern, and, but um, and that's that's why I think the city staff brought the kept paying attention to this. Now, um, uh, how that would play out in the future, I, I think is going to we just don't know. I mean, I, I um, uh, you, you look for some alternative, some other way to end this, and that's. There's going to be risks no matter what you do. Right, thank you, Attorney. So it's not a legal opinion. Um, malfeasance uh, seems as though it's a, um, it's a high bar. Um, I think for the purposes of a discussion, um, it should result if malfeasance is found in the removal. I don't know how we could create a situation where we will find in malfeasance um, that a planning board member as doing ought not what he be done or I'm never going to get it uh, doing or doing what he ought not to do um, and then continue to allow that member to serve on the board I um, encouraged by uh, different ways to share uh, a strong belief that um, the process uh, needs to work from a uh, a planning department and staff standpoint we've got to figure out there's a lot that goes on in the city of Portsmouth to then have uh, another kind of stream that kind of comes in and that's not to say that that stream is not important to, to, to have or that questions aren't being raised that should be addressed but the people appearing before the land use boards deserve to know what that process is they need to be able to at the very least know you know you shouldn't have to file a public records request to get all the information that a member might be considering like that's that that can't happen we got you know folks that are 
not lawyer. I, mean, we're, I think we've spent an enormous amount of time talking about um, big developers, and that's kind of what this has been put in context to. But like, I don't know if everybody remembers, myself included, just how not scary but overwhelming it is to go before a land use board. It's overwhelming the first time you do it. Um, and it shouldn't be overwhelming. We should make it as easy as possible, and we should make it so that the folks that are going before there know that they're going to have a fair adjudication before that. That's the crux of why I believe the city brought this, is they felt that this was not uh, occurring. I think it is, um, it's incredibly uh, hard to determine that based on the intent and based on you know just a disagreement from Superior Court whether or not meetings are occurring outside of, of public record. That's, at least that disagreement is now clear uh, to me. I will continue not to reply all the emails uh, because I know that that could create a quorum. Uh, if I do, I never send emails out to um, all the council uh, because of that. You know, um, even if there are things that are not even related to actual business, like there's been an invitation to the city of Portsmouth. I want to extend that. I will ask Joanna to send that um, out on behalf so that it's understood. But I, I digress. I can you clarify what Joanna? It's not Joanna. I would the, not the assistant mayor. I'm talking about the real mayor of Portsmouth, Joanna Deemer, uh, who sits on the fourth floor here and basically. Uh, answers most phone calls and, and points people in the right direction. Um, I, so I, I would caution against us um, trying to figure out another soft landing uh, for this outside of thing, figuring out the facts that are presented. I understand that there could be a desire um, in the future or through the planning board to have a firmer discussion around uh, outside of outside of. Um, outside of uh, uh, malfeasance and removal uh, around uh, that. But for the purposes of, of, of this, um, I, I guess I, I want to be clear, and I'll pass the gavel for this, and I don't even know how this, this is the same as, a, I guess it's Robert Rules. Um, for the purposes of this, I, I can't support uh, the decision to remove for malfeasance. Um, I would like to state a few reasons uh, for that. Um, first, the thing um, I uh, I am uh, you know I, I know um, this has been difficult for you, uh, Mr. Hewitt, and for Liza. I appreciate that as a um, as a member of this community, and um, while that is a uh, important point uh, for me as a human to consider as an adjudicator. Uh, it's not something that, that factored in, but I want to express that I do appreciate uh, you and I understand that this has not been an easy situation for you uh, or for, for Liza. Um, it's not been an easy situation uh, for myself uh, to think about uh, the terms of this. This has probably been one of the more difficult things uh, that I had, and if you ask my wife, I've been the most irritable person uh, that, and that's a high bar for me um, at home. And it is something that is probably the, the, the most difficult decision that I've been faced with as a counselor, um, as a mayor, uh, because of all the reasons why it is important. The public trust is absolutely critical. That business is done in public is absolutely paramount to how we do business as a government of the people for the people, by the people. That's the, that's the standard. It cannot be done outside of this realm. Now, um, I, I thought uh, Attorney Eggleton made many uh, um, uh, strong points and we debated a lot. Um, there's one point that I, I uh, voraciously disagree on, and that is that this is a politically motivated process. That is something that when it was raised to me, it is just an anathema to everything that I think that is important up here. <laughs> yes, I know that Jim probably didn't vote for me, you know, um, but I appreciated every time I saw him on the sidewalk uh, uh, being able to support his candidates. I think that is the crux of our government that we can hold differing opinions uh, and continue to be nice to one another and continue to take people at their word that they are delivering what they believe to be the best interests of the city of Portsmouth. We've talked about 
extensively the idea of public service and encouraging engagement. We will not have that in Portsmouth if we continue to paint everybody as having a political bias in every decision that we make. That cannot occur in the city of Portsmouth. It happens, and I'm more passionate about this because you know, somebody that, that enjoys politics, I am so frustrated that I don't even like talking about politics uh, any longer. It is something that has occurred on the national level that seeps in. It's not the same lines. We have, you know, it's not party systems here in Portsmouth, but there are political lines that are drawn. That is impossible to get down into the details and make accurate decisions for the betterment of our community if we think that there is some ulterior motive. So I'd ask everyone that is, in, that is really focused on encouraging participation, how can you foster that in your dialogue at public comment? How can you think of raising above politics, of raising above a perceived bias, and come together and say, I believe that you are doing as best you can with the tools that you have. I disagree with you. I appreciate that you can make a different decision with me without having uh, to firmly throw everything else that, that, we're, that we're trying to do out with that. I believe that, Mr. Hewitt, you were, um, you were appointed at a somewhat contentious time. I, uh, I recall this. I recall making many points in the conversation of why you should not be appointed. Frankly, there were uh, a bias. I'd never, you know, I think that everybody should be indifferent. I never heard that from you. I heard that from the former mayor that said something along the lines of, you know, the only way we're going to really change this is that we have to start with the makeup of the boards. I don't believe that to be true. I believe that we have to have indifferent people that are passionate about Portsmouth, that are willing to spend the time that they are sacrificing to, to be here. You could spend the time with your, uh, your, your, your sons, your wife. I could do the same with my daughters and my wife. It is difficult at best to, to believe that this is an easy job. Yours is not an easy job. You deal with property rights of people. That is a very difficult position. But it's not a political position. You will interpret the zoning that's in front of you. We rely on you bringing as much to that uh, as possible. And in the master plan process, we will rely on you from a regulatory perspective. That will continue. Uh, it's, it's just a point that I need to underscore that there cannot be bias. There cannot be changes of our zoning occurring at the land use boards. They have to occur through a public process, the master plan and amendments all within this chamber. That's how we get the zoning that Portsmouth deserves and wants. That is why I, I, I think I've been the most frustrated I've been is because this has been portrayed as a political, uh, a political process when it is, in my mind, the furthest from a political process. This is, you know, it's the furthest from a political process. And I will um, take Mr. Hewitt at his word that he will follow the rules that are newly established, that he will move things through the chair to be a part of the public record. And I would welcome any suggestions as a planning board member to the council on how we can improve the process uh, around that. Um, and I will not vote uh, to find uh, malfeasance, uh, and I will not vote uh, to remove. Any other, Councilor Bagley? Uh, should we make a motion? Sure. It's gonna have to sooner or later. Uh, <laughs> I move that we. Uh, sorry, I move that we conclude the hearing. I got a second. I'll speak to it. Second. Um, I, I don't. I agree with the mayor. I don't. I think serious issues have been raised um, in the broader context recently by the mayor, and also in this particular case through the last two days. Uh, but I don't believe that the council needs to take action at this time. Um, I don't believe that there's a need for a center. I think Mr. Hewitt has. Uh, been through enough already 
and uh, that is why I made the motion. So, uh, I, oh, I'm sorry. I just had a clarifying question. You you want to end the hearing with no motion, no motion to. So we have two. No. Just so we have two motions that were presented to us: one yes. to find that there was malfeasance and to act as a removal; one to not, and then as a result, not find that there is um, uh, a, the ability to remove. And those are in the. And is that knowing that? And it's late. Yeah, I'm reading Mr. Eggleston's proposed motion. Um, so for the record, um, uh, this is, uh, you know, I hope not to do this a second time to be an expert on this. Um, the city of Portsmouth has charged uh, James Hewitt, a member of the planning board, with removal under RSA 673, uh, colon 13, which reads, after public hearing, appointed members and alternative members have been appointed, land, local land use board may be removed by appointing authority upon written findings of efficiency, neglect of duty, or malfeasance in office. Uh, the council has before a first motion asking the council to find that the city has met its burden of proving that Mr. Hewitt has committed malfeasance in office. Okay, so I guess those are the charging documents. My God, okay. Um, so, um, uh, Attorney Lachlan. Can I phone a friend on this? What's going on? What? <laughs> so how do we end the, I don't know if we can simply end the hearing. Is that correct? I mean, we could, but um, can we? Um, Where's the motion? Your Honor, would you like me to rescind and take a second shot at using the language? Sure, yeah. why don't you do that? All right, I rescind my previous motion. Um, second. The. I move that the council has found that the city has not met the burden of proof for removal of office of Mr. Hewitt for efficiency, neglect of duty, or malfeasance in office. Is there a second? Is there? A I'll second that. And I guess by the lack of a quick second there, maybe that's not the best motion, but that's the best I have in me. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I don't think we've, I think the motion speaks for itself. That's my opinion, that uh, malfeasance has not occurred and certainly inefficiency or neglect of duty have not occurred. Okay, um, Councilor Cook. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, would it not make sense to vote on the motions in front of us uh, rather than creating new motions? And if the I'm motion not seeing the motion. So what's the just the motion from the, the city attorney? Yeah. On yes. This? Okay. And, okay. and then if it does not pass, it does not pass. Okay. I think that sends a. I guess yeah. Okay. I will rescind my motion. Again. <clears throat> Again, somebody else is going to have to take the third shot. <laughs> so, Thank you. okay, so um, these, yeah, I, okay, so that is the city's request for finding and ruling proposed motions. I move that. Is this the one that we're talking about? Councilor Moreau, mm -hmm. Councilor Cook? Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so. I'm just raising it about even not finding finding that there's no male you never believe. Yeah, I would think yeah. so. I don't know what that's the wording is I can Okay. Um so if we vote against the following, the council find that the allegations in the charging document are supported by the evidence presented at the hearing, including the testimony of witness documents submitted, the memorandum of law submitted by council, public comment, and the arguments of council. The council finds that the city has established that Mr. Hewitt has committed malfeasance in office pursuant to R60. Uh, R6 or RSA uh, 673 colon 13 dash I. That's if that is moved, we can discuss that and either vote for or against it. Did you find any, did you, well, the opposite find that there was not malfeasance? Yes, if that, if this is voted down. So I guess, 
Sorry, I'm tired. Yeah, you're, <laughs> Your Honor, I think it's straight. <laughs> just for clarification, the reason I don't want to move that motion, even if we were to vote it down, is I think it sends a stronger message than finding that we didn't find, than passing a motion saying that we didn't find malfeasance. No. But I may be alone in that opinion. That it sends, well, I think that, um, I think it sends the same message if we vote down the malfeasance or find that they didn't meet the burden of proof. It's the opposite. We have one written out. The attorneys, I believe, agreed on these motions. Is this a correct statement? Yes, we discussed the motion. I'm, I'm fine with the city's motion. Okay. Uh, just for clarity, though, a negative vote means the city did not meet the burden. That's correct, yes. So the motion before us, I will await the motion that I previously just read and I, that I will read it again then. I await the motion that the council find that the allegation uh, in the charging documents are supported by the evidence presented at the hearing, including the testimony of witnesses and documents submitted, the memorandums of law submitted by council, public comment, and the arguments of council. The council finds that the city has established that Mr. Hewitt has committed malfeasance in office pursuant to RSA 673, uh, colon 13, section I. So moved. Second. Okay. And so it is clear to vote yes in the affirmative means that the city has, has made their case for malfeasance and that, um, you know, we would then be, it's argued whether or not we'd be bound to remove, but malfeasance, as the attorney has pointed out, creates with it issues if we find and don't uh, do that. To find in the negative means that we do not support that and thus do not entertain the second motion on the floor or in the packet. Is that clear? Is there any more discussion? Okay. I would uh, ask uh, Kelly to please uh, call the vote. Okay. Assistant Mayor Kelly? No. Councilor Tabor? No. Council Cook? No. Council Blaylock? Yes. Council Bagley? No. Council Moreau? No. Council Lombardi? No. Mayor McEachern? No. Good way to motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.